leaders today and business leaders. H how do we transition faster than what we are now because we're at real risk of missing our targets? Oh, so that's really simple. You stop funding, you stop subsidizing, you stop using money into fossil fuels. Right. It could be carbon sequestration, it could be right. fuel rebates, it could be anything. Hundreds of billions of dollars getting ashed yeah. while we ash the planet on fossil fuel subsidies. Because we haven't had that renewable electricity, we haven't had that green hydrogen, we've kind of been pushed down, pushed yeah. down. It's all sorts of excuses. Oh, it'll never be commercial. Right. It'll never be supplied in the quantities we need it. You know, blah, blah, blah. Now we know. Let's take action. Mm -hmm. It's practical. Mm -hmm. It's implementable. Let's do it now. Okay, if we do it now, is there going to be a shock to the energy system? Is there going to be a shock actually to economically? And is it worth, you know, not talking about transition, just going from A to B? Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic question. A to B is the solution. Let fossil fuels do what fossil fuels do. Just burn their coal, burn their oil, burn the gas. At least they're pumping up carbon and methane into the atmosphere, honestly. Well, not that honest because they don't measure methane, which is 90 times worse than yeah. carbon. But at least the carbon is being done honestly. Encourage the green hydrogen sector to come in really fast. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's there. There's there's renewable power all over the world. We now know how to make electrolyzers much cheaper, like 25% of the original cost. We know how to do that now. We don't have an excuse to get into it. Does it need to be cheaper than oil and fossil fuel for it to be viable worldwide? Well, right now it is. Okay, so let's just swallow that bit of financial data. Right now is cheaper and it's getting more cheap it's but, it's the only right. fuel you know Mr. Of, which is declining in value you, you don't have enough of it right to power the world ah yes that that's only because uh we haven't had policies to support it we had policies to support it five ten years ago it would be everywhere you'd see the global warming budget start to come down yeah. now we've got five or ten years to make a huge difference I need policy leaders all over the world mm -hmm. to appreciate now, okay, big business is transacting with green hydrogen in multi-billion dollar agreements. We now know it's yeah. here and it's here to stay. Let's spread it everywhere. Coming up on the program, the hydrogen revolution. We'll speak with the CEO of Italian utility firm SNAM about his new book and why he thinks green hydrogen will be competitive in just five years. Plus, how are airlines working to become more sustainable? We'll look at how Airbus plans to step up in the climate fight. This is Bloomberg Green.
from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. I'm Kaylee Lines, and this is Bloomberg Green. What will the world look like in 2050? Will global temperatures have stabilized, electric vehicles be abundant, and solar and wind power homes around the world? According to Marco Alvera, the CEO of Italian energy company SNAM, that vision of the future could be a reality. And he says that hydrogen will pave its way. As he tells it in his new book, The Hydrogen Revolution, Alvera's moment of reckoning came in November 2018 when he tasked the SNAM Scenarios team with studying how Europe could reduce its CO2 emissions to zero by 2050. Looking through the results of the study, Alvera said he was struck by how much hydrogen was in Europe's energy mix by that year. Beyond the abundance of hydrogen, the SNAM model also predicted that it would be the cheapest form of decarbonized energy for many sectors, and that it could be cheaper than today's prices for oil, coal, and nuclear power. Our Maria Tadeo spoke with Alvera at COP26. It's happening all very fast. We see the cost of hydrogen coming down a lot. Hydrogen will play a big role in the energy mix. I don't know if it's going to be 15 or 25 percent of a fully decarbonized energy system, but it's going to be big. Costs are coming down and people are waking up to the fact that it's the only way to decarbonize certain sectors, the so-called hard to abate sectors. And you say it's the only way and the costs are coming down. Where do you see prices moving? Because a lot of the reticence at times has to do with the pricing, that some argue, well, it's still not the cheapest option on the market. So when I was first working in hydrogen in 2004, it was costing $1,000 per megawatt hour. 2010, 600. Today, 100. And we see it going down to 50 in five years' time and to going down to $25 per megawatt hour in the next 10 years or so, which is a quarter of where it is today. That's really because renewable energy, and we're talking green hydrogen here, renew renewable energy costs are falling, but the cost of making the electrolyzer, which is the kit that you use to convert solar or wind energy and water into hydrogen, the cost of this kit is falling a lot because it doesn't really exist on an industrial scale. So as we build up capacity, we industrialize it, we standardize it, and we squeeze costs out. That's really the cost trajectory. And for that, of course, you need demand, however, for governments and also institutions to kind of buy into this idea that it is the future and we want to invest and create infrastructure. What are they telling you when you speak to governments, when you speak to officials? Are they are they keen on this? They're very keen. So the Department of Energy shares our view in, a, in the states of getting to below $1 a kilo, which is $25 a megawatt hour. The European Union has a, a hydrogen strategy, which is very clear, and several member states have the same. Chile wants to export a lot of hydrogen. Uh, China's big on hydrogen. Australia's very big on hydrogen. Japan is blending already hydrogen. So I would say the world is now really focused on this because it's the only way to store energy for a long period of time economically is to convert it into either a liquid or a gas. And of course you talk about the price, but the other big component is, is the volume. You know, how big can you go? Where do you see that on a time scale? So wherever it's sunny or windy, you can produce very cheap hydrogen eventually. And so compared to oil and gas, which are concentrated in few parts of the world, it's going to be very democratic from that point of view. So every sunny place, every desert, every ocean wind can be turned into hydrogen that we can put on ships, in pipes, and really start trading it around the world. So it's going to happen a lot faster than a lot of people think. So, and, and when you say a lot faster, what, what is that in time? As I said, $50, which is essentially oil parity within five years, and then depending on uh, how quickly we ramp it up after that, we could get to $25, which is coal parity before the end of the decade. And in big scale. In big scale, because once you get to coal parity, that's the only way we're going to get China and India uh, to stop burning new coal. We have businesses in China and in India, and I see a lot of hydrogen development, a lot of renewable development in both countries. The India announcement was incredibly strong mm. on 2030. Some people were upset about the 2017 at zero deadline, but when it comes to 30, he announced a big, big commitment to get to 50% renewables. Were you surprised renewables. by it? I was surprised that they would make it so explicit. And even the net zero is a big thing for them. And so I think it will happen faster than 2070 because of the falling cost of renewable and hydrogen. India's burning 80 gigawatt of oil, of diesel, to keep the lights on. So there's an immediate opportunity there. And we're very interested in working that country. And with regards to China, perhaps the fact that we haven't really seen them active, I guess the diplomats are working on this, but we haven't really seen the leadership. Uh, it's going to be technology. It's going to be industry. I think China has committed to a net zero, which is very important. At the G20, China was clearly uh, behind the one and a half uh, degrees. So I think a lot has been achieved between the G20 and, and COP. And I think what's really important is to see in the coming years how quick it's in our hands 
to make part of this happen in five years or it could otherwise happen in 15, 20 years. It's about building the project. The capital is there. Uh, we, we, we saw how many trillions of dollars are already committed. What's missing is really the projects, and that's where companies like us step in. Marco Alvera, CEO of SNAM there, speaking with our Maria Tadeo. Let's turn now to the aviation industry. It's a big contributor to global greenhouse gas emissions, and it's under pressure to change that. In October, the International Air Transport Association, a trade body representing airlines, approved a target of achieving net zero emissions by 2050. To achieve that, many airlines in the U.S. and Europe are looking to buy sustainable aviation fuel made from renewable sources like used vegetable oil. Initiatives like these are pushing plane makers to come up with some radical new aircraft that will eventually cater to our growing appetite for travel without hurting the environment. We took a look at how Airbus, the world's number two aircraft manufacturer, is stepping up to the challenge. How long until we can fly emission free? Airbus says it's more confident by the day it can be done by its 2035 target. Airbus's CEO spoke about its ambitions for hydrogen-powered planes at the company's summit in France. The physics works. Um, hydrogen technologies are not new. They are used in, in other sectors. We use them in space on our rockets, and we don't need the laws of physics to change to be able to use hydrogen on our planes. So every day we become more confident, uh, but we think we need to have a plane, we need to have the, the right fuels, the hydrogen available in, in the right quantity at the right place at the right time, and we need the regulations to be ready. So we really need the, the work and the collaboration of many people around the globe to make it happen on time. But it could be a long wait until green passenger jets go mainstream. Larger aircraft with more than 150 seats are not expected to feature globally until about 2050. That means manufacturers and airlines today are under growing pressure to ramp up short-term innovations to cut their carbon. In the long term, meeting the ambitious plans for so-called green hydrogen means building a giant industry almost from scratch. To make that happen, British airline EasyJet is among those saying governments need to get involved and fast. Aviation's emissions over the last three decades leading up to the pandemic grew by about 80% to over one gigaton, and that's projected to double by 2050. According to Bloomberg NEF, about half of the airlines with the largest global market share have set net zero targets by that same date, nearly three decades away. Coming up from blue sky projects to the bottom line, we'll speak with our Bloomberg NEF expert Meredith Annex and dig into their models about how hydrogen fits into the future energy mix. This is Bloomberg Green.
Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. I'm Kaylee Lines, and this is Bloomberg Green. Now let's bring in Meredith Annex, our Bloomberg NEF hydrogen specialist, to talk more about how hydrogen could change the energy landscape. So Meredith, what place do you think hydrogen is likely to have in the future energy mix globally? Hydrogen's this incredible solution for us as we look to decarbonize because it's a perfect solution in areas that are hard to electrify. So where we like to think about hydrogen playing a role, it's in things like heavy industry, especially where you need a feedstock as well as energy source, and in things like dispatchable power, long haul transport, maybe even shipping and aviation. That sounds great that it can be used for such diverse industries. At the end of the day though, how much is this going to cost? Well, that's the amazing thing about hydrogen because depending on how you make it, it can actually see significant cost declines in the future. So when we're talking about clean hydrogen, we usually mean green hydrogen produced from renewable electricity. And in that case, your hydrogen is almost as cheap as the renewables that are used to make it. So if you're in a place with really good renewable resources, you'll be able to have cheaper hydrogen. But even in places with less good resources, we think that hydrogen can be cheaper than a dollar per kilogram, uh, which is the price of unabated hydrogen today, and around $8 per million BTUs for those who prefer to think in energy units. Uh, and that can be cheap anywhere in the world by 2050, we believe. All right, so let's talk about kind of the pros and cons list. I don't know where cost fits into that, but what are the advantages to hydrogen over other renewables, and then what are the drawbacks? Yeah, main advantage is the fact that hydrogen can serve roles that electrons struggle with. And that's things like uh, seasonal storage, for instance, or just anything where you need storability, where electrons are harder to store, hydrogen is going to be easier. That also leads to a downside, though, because hydrogen is less energy dense than the usual things that we use for storable energy today, like coal or oil or natural gas. So you will need more volume of storage to handle the same amount of energy. Let's talk about the viability as well and how it may differ in different geographies. What is your view on that? Yeah, so for green hydrogen, again, from renewable electricity, really places with the best renewable resources, things like Latin America or the Middle East, uh, even Southern Europe have really, really good potential for producing hydrogen. And then when you're looking at uh, blue hydrogen, which is produced from natural gas or coal with carbon capture and storage, we do see that becoming more expensive than green hydrogen in the future, uh, especially as renewable electricity costs come down. But that can be a viable option in places like the U.S. Gulf Coast or Russia, where you've got good geological storage for the carbon, uh, as well as ample natural gas that's quite cheap. All right, great breakdown. Thank you so much to our Meredith Annex, our Bloomberg NEF hydrogen specialist. And of course, you can get more from the Bloomberg NEF team on the terminal and online. And they've recently done a podcast called Hydrogen 101 as part of its Switched On series. So from iron ore titans pivoting to cleaner energy to talk of a hydrogen revolution, that's it from this week's edition of Bloomberg Green. We'll be back next week with a deep dive into the state of electric vehicles. And you can keep the conversation going by following us on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter at Climate. I'm Kaylee Lines from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York, and this is Bloomberg Green.
sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business App, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. We are well off session lows, still red on the screen. The S&P right now down by six points, have been down as many as 80, down 2.1%. Right now looking at a loss of two-tenths of 1% on the S&P. Stocks lower across the board, though, with the Dow down 97, have been down almost as many as 600 points. Uh, recovery down now by three-tenths of 1%. NASDAQ is down 48, dropped there of four-tenths of 1%. And the NASDAQ 100 index lower now by four tenths of one percent spot gold down nine dollars the ounce to 1808 drop there of five tenths of one percent the 10 year below three percent 2.98 percent right now on the 10 year and west texas intermediate crude is moving lower down 3.3 percent 10618 a barrel on wti stocks are dropping bonds are rallying as data showing a slowdown in consumer spending fueled concern about a recession as for how the consumer is holding up David Costin as chief strategist at Goldman Sachs. And so there's still a lot of challenges in the uh, and so the headwinds of of, of higher uh, of higher costs around uh, energy and mortgage rates, uh, sort of discretionary spending is going to be pressured. Food costs, a lot of pressures, and that's why focusing more uh, on more business oriented. Uh, sort of companies where their end market demand is coming would be a preferable area in terms of positioning a portfolio right now. He mentioned energy and oil on track for its first monthly decline since November. As OPEC Plus completes the return of output it halted during the pandemic. And President Biden says he will push allies in the Persian Gulf to boost production next month. Shares of oil companies are down. ExxonMobil tumbling 2.9%. ADRs of BP down 1.4%, Chevron down 1.2%, EOG Resources down 1.6%, and Pioneer Natural down now by 1.2%. Recapping S&P down two tenths, I'm Charlie Pellet. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news as it happens. Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Bloomberg Quick Takes' Tim Stenovic on Bloomberg Radio. And a very good afternoon, everyone. Live from our Bloomberg Interactive Brokers studio. We are streaming on YouTube. We are also live from our BTV5 studio. Carol Masser, Tim Stenovic is off again today and in his place, Bloomberg Market Senior Editor, uh, Markets Editor, I should say, Michael Regan. And Mike, I feel like here we are, the last day of June, getting ready up to uh, wrap up quite a second quarter and quite a first half of 2022. Right. Uh, worst first half to the year for the stock market since 1970. Mm. Um, I hope, Carol, no one asks me if I was trading <laughs> in, in 1970. But uh, Who was president? Who was president? We'll have to ask our guests that, that question. <laughs> All right, we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, stocks definitely are down. We've seen that 10-year go below 3%, so a lot coming uh, ahead. We're going to be checking out two stocks, Mike. First of all, if you're feeling brave, then maybe Tesla shares are for you. We'll explain that. And then, I love this, stick a fork in it, call it done. Some commentary, uh, Mike, on Bed Bath & Beyond. This one has had such a tough run. Right, right. Yeah, and we're also going to talk about uh, the Bloomberg Business Week new heist issue, uh, the novelty wrapper and her startup guy, and the biggest crypto heist gone wrong. And let's not forget, we've got Micron earnings after the close, so a lot coming ahead in the next three hours. Let's get to the Market Drivers Report. And let's set your Business Week agenda. Let's get right to it, because we do want to talk markets. We want to talk about the day's economic news and thinking. Michael McKee is International Economics and Policy Correspondent at Bloomberg. He's in our Interactive Brokers studio, along with Bloomberg Markets Correspondent, uh, Kriti Gupta. So so, um, Mike, I do want to start with you because I do feel like so much of what happens in the equity trade is contingent on the economic news. Talk to us about the reads we got this morning. Well, we got bad, some, some good news, some bad news. Uh, incomes were up half a percent, which was not bad at all. Uh, but spending was up only two tenths, and if you adjust for inflation, it was down by four tenths. So the Atlanta Fed GDP now, which is the one sort of indicator of where they think GDP will be that everybody can get. Lots of people have their own proprietary ones, but that one suggests that second quarter growth was negative 1% so far, which would be two quarters in a row of negative growth, which is not 
technically an inflation, but a lot of people are going to feel depressed about it. The good news in there was that the core rate of inflation in the PCE that the Fed follows fell to 4.7 percent on an annual basis from 4.9 percent. So uh, going in the right direction, whether it stays that way or not, we'll have to see. Yeah, and Mike, probably not enough to really move the needle on what the Fed has in store for interest rate hikes, right? Just that little bit of cooling off in the core PCE. Do you think it changes the, the no, calculus at all? it doesn't change anything at all. Uh, we still have a CPI report to go before we get the Fed's uh, elect decision. We have a, a retail sales report, and of course, next Friday, a week <laughs> from tomorrow, we get the jobs report for June. So all those yeah. things will go into the Fed's thinking. Maybe it becomes a decision between 50 and 75, but it's still going to be a major rate increase because the Fed feels they are behind the curve on inflation now. Right. And just a reminder that these data points are not going to come down or change overnight. So, Creedy, that brings us to the equity trade and the financial market trade. We're off our lows of the day, but it's, you know, equity investors are reminded again that, as I just said, these data points, whether it's inflation coming down, uh, and kind of uh, some of the negative sentiment, you know, rebounding, that's going to take a while. It is going to take a while. And I agree with, with Mike when he said that this isn't really going to make that much of a difference, even if you did see this marginal cooling off. But I think the markets, the knee-jerk reaction, at least when that data came out, it was actually a tick higher. I mean, of course, we've been in the red all day. But I think in features, it is notable that the knee-jerk was higher. So there is perhaps, once again, that on the surface, a little bit of a positive read, but it didn't clearly stick through. For today, the trade is 100% rebalancing. It comes down to the fact that today is the last day of the month, the last day of the quarter, the last day of the first half. Um, and Mike said it was the worst start since 1970, I believe. I think earlier this morning. I'm thinking was, Richard Nixon was president, but let's see. I Googled it. <laughs> I didn't have to Google it. How could we forget? McKee was like, I lived it. He was president. Um, I did not live it. But uh, what I will say is I did read about not just 1970, but 1962 as well. And this is my big tidbit of the day that I've been repeating all day long, is that in 1962, you had nine straight months of declines. And it was a really big deal because it was called the Kennedy slide. And you kind of had this reversal or this pivot point at the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 1962. So I think for me, the parallel parallel here is that you have all of these same issues, inflation, this background of these monumental gains in the stock market, this repricing in the market as well, but it still feels like perhaps the war in Ukraine is that pivot point that the markets need to turn around. Where, where was where was the S&P um, 12 months after the low in 62, the first half of 62? Am I supposed Come to Come on, you're, supposed you're, supposed you're to the, the stock guy. Like, I'm guessing it was up. I would guess up. 29%. Uh, huh? And two years it was up. Forty nine percent. There you go. So this is a buy signal. I mean, this is that's what the I keep, that's the the, the depth <laughs> of my <laughs> Well, Mike, I keep thinking about, and I can't remember who our guest was, but who basically said that it's eight months from when the Fed stops, you know, starts stops raising rates and then starts cutting rates. So I I keep thinking about like when that moment will come. We don't know, uh, and the Fed doesn't know. Uh, Partly because there's, there aren't enough really um, historical examples to give you a statistically valid sample. But uh, this is also a different kind of inflation, a lot of it on the supply side. Uh, and as Curdy said, you know, the war is a big factor. If all of a sudden the war ends and more oil comes on the market and the price of oil drops, inflation, headline inflation is going to drop a lot. And we'll see agricultural inflation drop a lot, which will help food. And the Fed won't have had to do anything. Uh, it looks from the numbers that we saw today in terms of uh, spending that Americans are pulling back in the economy is slowing. So you, <coughs> well, you Mike, could say it, be, it could come quickly or it could just drag out. Real quickly, though, if we do get these two consecutive negative quarters of GDP growth, there was a lot of talk about, well, the first quarter contraction didn't really count for a variety of technical reasons. But what do you think? Will the NBER, the, the group that officially declares a recession, do you think they would consider this uh, no, a recession? No, not at all. And, and the reason is simple. There's a whole lot of things they look at besides just GDP. But one of the things they look at is jobs. And we created like 400,000, 450,000 jobs a month on average in the first quarter and pretty much close to that in the second quarter. And there's, that's no sign of a recession. Yeah, it's going to take a while to change that, right, and bring that down. Um, guys, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Kriti Gupta, markets correspondent at Bloomberg in our interactive broker studio, along with our own Michael McKee, international economics and policy correspondent at Bloomberg News. All right, off to world and national news and off to Nancy Lyons in D.C. Hey, Nance.
Thanks, Carol. It's an historic day at the Supreme Court with Ketanji Brown Jackson taking a seat on the bench, the first African-American woman to do so. Retired Justice Stephen Breyer and Chief Justice John Roberts administered the two required oaths. Then Roberts welcomed her to the bench. Now on behalf of all of the members of the court, I am pleased to welcome Justice Jackson to the court and to our common calling. Jackson was confirmed to replace Justice Breyer in April, but she had to wait until he stepped down at the end of the nine-month term. Well, today the Supreme Court did issue its final rulings for the term, including one that restricts the EPA's ability to force power plants to shift power generation away from fossil fuel plants to cleaner sources. We get more from Bloomberg legal analyst June Grosso. The conservatives are siding with the coal mining companies and the Republican states. It's a blow to Joe Biden's climate agenda. You know, will he be able to reach the emission standards that he said? Bloomberg's June Grasso, the president wants to cut U.S. emissions in half by the end of the decade and completely by 2035. In a victory for President Biden, the court sided with his administration and its efforts to end a Trump-era immigration policy that forced asylum seekers to await approval in Mexico. Israel is now facing its fifth election in four years. The fragile governing coalition led by Prime Minister Naftali Bennett has collapsed, setting the stage for an election November 1st. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. All right, Nancy Lyons, thank you so much. Carol Master, along with Bloomberg Market Senior Editor Michael Regan, here on Bloomberg Business Week on this Thursday. And Nancy Lyons just talked about this, uh, about uh, a Supreme Court ruling, Mike. And it, 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 I think we should spend a little bit more time on it. It actually plays into some of the gainers that I'm going to talk about later on our uh, simulcast. But uh, a deeply divided U.S. Supreme Court dealing a major blow to President Biden's climate change agenda, restricting the Environmental Protection Agency's ability to curb power plant emissions and saying Congress would have to act to give the agency more authority. And so this plays into climate change goals or pressures or heightened regulatory oversight uh, and some of the goals that are out there. And this certainly changes. I think I saw some of the utilities certainly higher today. Right. And, uh, Carol, it's real big uh, moving of the goalposts for business, mm. too, when you think about it. I mean, remember uh, Obama and, and Biden uh, had – their goal was to reduce U.S. emissions by half – uh, at the end of the decade. And, you know, a lot of automakers and, and other companies were, were trying to move in that direction. And now I guess it's the question is, do they even bother now or do they assume, you know, that Congress is going to somehow uh, codify that into law? So it, it's a tough time to be a decision maker in some of these carbon intensive industries, I imagine. Right. And the majority said that while the APA can regulate power plant emissions, the agency can't try to shift power generation away from fossil fuel plants to cleaner sources uh, as for Former President Obama's clean power plant sought to do. Writing for the court, Chief Justice uh, John Roberts saying Congress needs to speak more explicitly to give an agency that much more power. So basically it's kind of telling Congress what they need to do, Mike. The other thing is I wonder then if states, there are certain states, right? We always talk about California leading the way when it comes to uh, climate change policy. So do states just then kind of step in here? Yeah, and that's another big, you know, uh, problem for, for local politicians. Do you do that and sort of, you know, risk having businesses leave your state as a result? Right. Um, it's a lot of uncertainty out there for, for decision makers, uh, large and small. Yeah, right. It's just another, another element, if you will. All right, you are listening to Bloomberg Business Week on Bloomberg Radio.
sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet, the Dow, the S&P, and NASDAQ, all in the red. Treasury yields declined sharply after gauges of consumer spending and inflation rose less than forecast, bolstering bond market sentiment that Federal Reserve rate hikes will cause a recession. The tenure now is at 2.98 percent. We've got uh, the S&P 500 index down 12, a drop of three-tenths of one percent. The Dow is down 139, down by five-tenths of one percent, quite the recovery, given the fact that the Dow have been down 597 points. NASDAQ is down 65 for the NASDAQ Composite Index, a drop right now of six-tenths of 1%. Again, that 10-year yield, 2.98%. Spot gold down $10 the ounce to 1807, lower now by six-tenths of 1%. And West Texas Intermediate Crude is down 3.3%, 106.05 a barrel. So again, recapping, stocks lower, S&P down three-tenths. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that... Is a Bloomberg Business Flash. It is indeed. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. Charlie Pellet there. Well, you're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Masser and Mike Regan, our Bloomberg Markets uh, Senior Editor, uh, in for Tim Stenovic today. So today, I don't know if you guys heard this, but from the NATO summit in Madrid, we did have President Biden saying he would support changing the Senate's filibuster rules to pass legislation, ensuring privacy rights and access to abortion, calling the Supreme Court, quote, destabilizing for controversial decisions uh, and including overturning rights versus Wade. So we've been really reporting on how a lot of different communities are continuing to react to that decision. So now we want to get the medical community's perspective. For that, let's bring in Dr. Suzanne Bell, Assistant Professor in Population, Family, and Reproductive Health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, supported by Michael R. Bloomberg, of course, founder of Bloomberg LP and Bloomberg Philanthropies. Suzanne joining us on the phone from Washington, D.C. Suzanne, great to have you here with Mike and myself. So let's get to it. What is hi there. is there? Hi, uh, good to have you here. Is there a consensus yeah, in terms of a consensus in terms of the medical community when it comes to Roe versus Wade? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Roe v. Wade and the overturning of it specifically will undoubtedly negatively affect pregnant people's health through through a number of mechanisms. I think the medical community and the public health community is really united in that front. I should clarify, I am not an ob guy. I am a doctor of demography in the School of Public Health, so just, just to be clear about that. But demographics are, demographics are important, right, in understanding the impact of something like absolutely. this. Absolutely, yeah, and a lot of my work studies... Uh, abortion and specifically uh, abortion safety in low resource settings where it's legally restricted, which now is the case in many states here in the U.S. Um, and there's going to be a number of mechanisms through which we see this decision negatively impacting people's health. First is that banning a restriction or restricting abortion will resort in more people being forced to carry unwanted or unviable pregnancies to term, which increases health risk to the pregnant person, giving, given that pregnancy has 14 times the risk of death than a safe abortion. And there was actually a study published last year uh, that estimated a remarkable 21% increase in the number of pregnancy-related deaths if Roe fell and all abortions were denied, mm. with a 33% increase among black women, specifically given the higher rates of maternal mortality that they are exposed to uh, in the U.S. The second mechanism is that, is that there's going to be more later abortions, which, while still very safe, are associated with a higher risk of complications. A third is that more people are going to be self-managing their abortions when they are unable to find facility-based care and access to safe, safe abortion. And so they'll turn to potentially unsafe and ineffective methods and may delay seeking care for complications given fears of legal repercussions. And then fourth is that longer, you know, there are a number of longer-term and broader health, safety, and financial impacts for those who are denied a wanted abortion. There's been a lot of great work from the Turnaway Study uh, folks at UCSF have detailed the negative impacts of being denied an abortion, and uh, I can speak to a, a number of those findings. But, Doctor, one thing I'm, I'm wondering, as Carol pointed out, uh, President Biden uh, does want to try to end the filibuster so that Congress mm -hmm. could sort of codify Roe versus Wade into law. But if that uh, effort fails, I I'm curious what you think about how well the U.S. healthcare system 
is sort of situated uh, for a sudden influ influx of more lower income women carrying uh, their their babies to term. I mean, is that it, it, it? My guess is that we're not very well situated for for that type of situation. What what do you think about that? And what sort of would you advise that we need to do to the healthcare system to prepare for that sort of outcome? Yeah, I mean, first I want to say that many people are going to seek abortions, even if the state in which they reside no longer allows safe abortion. So the first way in which the healthcare system is going to try to adapt to this new reality is by meeting demand in states where abortion is still protected. And um, some work by the Guttmacher Institute has shown that they are anticipating huge thousand plus fold increase percentage increases in um, states that are havens for abortion, like California, North Carolina, and Illinois in particular, where they're anticipating more than an 8,000 percent increase. So that's the first way in which our health system, I think, is going to try to adapt and meet demands under this new post row world and try to get as many people seeking a, a wanted uh, termination to, to, uh, be able to obtain those wanted services. I think, you know, in relation to those that are unable to, to seek uh, and obtain a, an abortion, you're going to have more people uh, continuing a pregnancy to term, more people exposed, as I mentioned, to the risks of pregnancy. Um, and those are disproportionately going to be people of color, in particular black people, who are three times more likely to, to, to have an abortion. Uh, than, than white non-Hispanic people, as well as people below the poverty line. And so you're going to have this change in the composition of people who are pregnant in some of these settings where abortion is being restricted, right. populations that already are disadvantaged and have lower access to prenatal care and poor maternal health outcomes. Suzanne, one so thing... that's going to be something to address. We have less than a minute left, and one thing I wanted to get to, and this were in some notes that you shared with uh, our producer, Paul, and, and, and obviously myself and Mike, is there a possibility that if you live in a state where there is the ban, um, that you will be restricted from going to a state that doesn't have a ban. Is that even something we should be thinking about and just got about 30 seconds? I mean, I think it's something to be concerned about. I know there's states that are moving to try to restrict the mobility of their residents uh, to obtain these services in, in neighboring states. I think the legality of that is going to ultimately go back to the court's and mm. determining whether that's possible, I personally don't don't think it would be within the legal uh, structure, and I also don't think that um, states will will force their their providers in settings where abortion is protected to, okay. to report that sort of information. Well, Suzanne. Nice to uh, get some time with you. Assistant Professor in Population, Family, and Reproducti Reproductive Health at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Joining us on the phone from Washington, D.C. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Masser, along with Bloomberg's Mike Regan. And this is Bloomberg Radio.
broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. You are listening and watching to Bloomberg Business Week on this Thursday. Carol Master, Tim Stenovic is off, and in his place is our own Michael Regan, who watches the markets. I feel like this next guest, I'm just going to kick back Mike and just let it, let you run with her. <laughs> okay, absolutely. I don't know about running. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm a little too tired to run, but I'll, uh, I'll, walk, I'll walk briskly with her. How about that? All right, we'll get to that in just a moment. Our own Jess Metton joining us. Uh, first up, though, back to the markets in the trading day and our own Charlie. All right, thank you very much. We're looking at a down day, red on the screen. Final trading day of the first half. Where has this year gone? Final day of the quarter. We have got the S&P right now down 16 at 3802, a drop right now of four tenths of one percent. The Dow is at 30,862, down 168 points today, a drop there of five tenths of one percent. And ahead of the second half, we have got Nasdaq down 85 points right now, drop there of eight tenths of one percent. The 10-year back below that psychological level of three percent, two point. 9.8% on the 10 year of 29.30 seconds. The price of gold, 18.07 the ounce, down $10 the ounce now, down six tenths of 1%. West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil, down 3.6% at 105.89 a barrel on WTI. Bottom line for the stock market today, we are seeing a recovery. The SP had been down 80 points at the worst level, down more than 2%. Again, the SP right now down by 16 points, a drop of four tenths of 1%. Stocks are lower bonds rallying as data showing a slowdown in consumer spending, the main driver of the U.S. economy, fueled concern about a recession. As for the economic outlook, Anastasia Amoroso is chief investment strategist at iCapital. So this is about coming back to normal. This is about coming back to prudence. And by the way, I don't think that's a bad thing for the economy, but it does mean that we're not going to grow 3 or 4% in terms of GDP. We're going to grow at 2% or probably even sub 2% as we progress to the end of the year. So that's just the reality. And as a market participant, uh, you have to adjust to that and obviously position accordingly. And speaking of consumer spending, high-end furniture ray retailer RH slumping after slashing its forecast for the second time in less than a month. RH down now by 10%. And Walgreens Boots Alliance is maintaining its guidance for 2022 earnings, even as the drugstore chain beat Wall Street's estimates for fiscal third quarter profit and revenue. Warner Boots Alliance, a WBA on the ticker, it is down now by 6.31%. Recapping, stocks lower, S&P down 19 now, drop there of 5 tenths. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, and we're going to stay with the markets for a moment because he mentioned some of uh, the rough trade so far here in 2022. Second quarter, first half of the year, wrapping up with more superlatives. S&P poised for its worst first half since 1970. You're going to hear us say that a lot today. Uh, Ten-year U.S. yields plunging to about 3 percent. We've actually seen them go below 3 percent from a decade high of nearly 3.5 percent earlier this month. The dollar's down, but still on pace for its best quarter since 2016, and the nearly 60% drawdown in Bitcoin since the end of March is the largest since the third quarter of 2011. Now, on the equity front, Bloomberg News equities reporter Jess Menton writing about how the bull market never ended for analysts who are sticking to their very optimistic market calls. She's there with Mike in our interactive broker studio. Jess, so you're, not, you're telling me that we're still seeing a lot of optimism when it comes to calls on specific names in the equity market? There's quite a bit of optimism, and a lot of analysts on the sell side, they're still wedded to this idea that a lot of stocks could still rally at least 100%. The sell-off has left about 33 companies in the Russell 1000 with forecasts for rallies of 100% or more in bear market casualties. If you're looking at, say, Peloton to Coinbase, they're forecast to double when you're looking at the consensus targets compiled by Bloomberg. And it's kind of a head-scratcher for some people <laughs> who might think, well, how could this be happening? But this isn't something that's new. This typically happens with the sell side, especially when you are in bear market environments. We did see it in March 2020. We saw it in 2008. In fact, in March 2020, there was nearly 300 companies that sat with predictions that they would double. And, and some of them, in fact, did because of, it was such a quick rebound. But in 2009, there were at least 100 companies that had those predictions that, unfortunately, many of them did not. 
You know, Jess, it's a fascinating environment because I feel like investors everywhere are like, what is wrong with these analysts? Uh, and, <laughs> and, and not just with price targets, but, but with earnings estimates, too. Right. Um, so I wonder, you know, what are some of the reasons people are saying for why analysts are reluctant to, to cut either, you know, say their price target or their earnings forecast? Some of it has to do with career risks. And then another big factor for this year particularly is just the murky outlook of what's going to happen with the trajectory for earnings, because those are obviously still very elevated, but obviously the trajectory of the economy with the question of when we could potentially see a peak in inflation. And as far as career risks are concerned, a lot of times analysts are reluctant to be that first one to make a big Big change. And then especially if you end up being wrong, you don't want that to be a potential career risk. But then other analysts think that some of these stocks, especially when you're looking at the Fed's rate hiking cycle and what's happening with the economy, they may have gotten overcompensated. And some some analysts... It's not like, Mike, we're going to write that headline story <laughs> that says, guess who got it wrong? Right. right. Well, I was going to say career risk. I think that's what Carol thinks of every time I fill in <laughs> no. as co-host for her. Oh, I love boy, when what, you join. <laughs> what is going to happen here? <laughs> no, no, no. But it is a good point. And you're right, just like it, I always, I always find it interesting that when just somebody comes out, it was even like in the, you know, the pandemic, like or George Floyd, like nobody wanted to talk about. It. And when that first CEO came out and talked, then everybody else would come out. Or, or when you know the first CEO comes came out and said, "I have no visibility," then everybody came out. There right, is something right. about that, right, Mike? Right. That right. happens. Yeah, right. that well, behavioral psychology of it. And even some analysts have told me they thought that by this point it might be too late because they're waiting <laughs> on a potential bottom. So if they change it now, they're saying, "Well, wait, this could be a potential buy." And they, they also were saying, "Well, it takes too much time for us to go through, and it, we we want to see." Wait, isn't that their job? <laughs> Yes. to go through. <laughs> yes, exactly. And they're also saying that at this point, they already expect the second quarter to be not great. And so they're looking ahead, okay, well, what does the next few quarters look at? But again, like to your point, Carol, that is your job to do that research, especially for people Jeez. who are buying you, you sell side job. research. You had one job. Well, Jess, I know you've written a lot about the notion of capitulation in the stock market uh, and, and how to recognize it. When will investors say, enough is enough, I'm selling everything, get me out at any price? I wonder if maybe this... Uh, a similar thing could happen with analysts. Do you think they could happen hand to hand? What, you know, what are people saying about that? It seems like it's almost when you're looking at the data, it, we'd have to be much closer to those recessionary type fears. And by that point, once they do start cutting them, then the markets could potentially rebound. So right. it is still, they're going to be late to the game. Eventually, if they do get to that point, people do start cutting those expectations then investors could miss out on those opportunities to buy some of those stocks, and that research could be delayed. So they're a contrarian indicator? So as far as what is specifically for analysts I, <laughs> on the sell side, I mean, I think as far as contrarian indicators, a lot of uh, people that I'm following, and, and Mike knows this too, as far as just looking at the technicals, and a lot of that just hasn't shown us just quite yet. We had yeah. seen a number of different head fakes, like in, in March and in May, and then maybe even earlier this month, but still from like a breadth momentum volume perspective, have not seen that. And especially the leadership still being very defensive right now. We'll find it if they're right, right, as earnings start to come out, and yeah. if we start to see those earnings estimates and forecasts. Um, by the C-suite come down, right, Mike? Like that'll right. be a big deal. And I can't. I always laugh because sometimes I feel like there's so many contrarians that it's sort of consensus <laughs> to be the contrarian, and I don't, I don't know what that means necessarily. All right, good discussion. Jess Metten, equities reporter at Bloomberg in our interactive broker studio. Back to D.C. and Nancy Lyons with World and National News. Hey, Nance. Thanks, Carol. President Biden is heading home from Europe, but before leaving Madrid, he told reporters he will confer with state governors tomorrow and how to preserve the right to abortion. Bloomberg Surf Chapman has more from Washington. The president was asked about the pressure by many Democrats for some dramatic action to counter the Supreme Court decision. I believe we have to codify Roe v. Wade in the law. And if the filibuster gets in the way, it's like voting rights, it should require an exception to the filibuster. Not just the right to choose, but the right to who you can marry. A whole range of issues relating to privacy. The president again denounced what he called the outrageous behavior of the Supreme Court, which needs to be reversed, he said, at the ballot box. In Washington, Irv Chapman, Bloomberg Radio. The House January 6th committee has issued a subpoena to former White House counsel Pat Cipollone. We get more from Bloomberg government reporter Jack Fitzpatrick. He's become a bit of a central figure because of his warnings that the uh, voter fraud claims did not have legal merit. He came up 
uh, warning that Trump should not go to the Capitol on January 6th. Bloomberg government's Jack Fitzpatrick reports the committee wants Cipollone to testify behind closed doors this coming Wednesday, July 6th. The world's most famous bicycle race begins tomorrow. The Tour de France will begin this year in Copenhagen and wind its way through France for 21 days before ending in Paris July 24th. Over 20 teams will be competing. Seven Americans are among the competitors. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. All right, Nance, thank you so much. Nancy Lyons in our 991 newsroom in Washington, D.C. Mike, you know what's worse than being um, a stock this year for the most part? Being a token. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't stop. It, it's just out of control. And, you know, Carol, I keep thinking back to those when a, a much younger Mike Regan started at Bloomberg in 2007, just in time for the wheels to fall off of the bus of the <laughs> financial system with the, the global financial crisis. But there's so many echoes of that with all this deleveraging and margin calls and sort of these shadow banks like Celsius just just uh, having these massive liquidity problems. I think... Are you really likening it to the... I mean, it doesn't feel systemic, does it? It, it? Not in a systemic way. I mean, it's it's a crisis within the crypto ecosystem that uh, in, in very many ways is uh, similar to the financial crisis. I think, to your point, the, the positive spin on it is that, okay, it was a $3 trillion industry, which is, you know, not small, but um, at least this is happening before it became a $10 trillion or a $20 trillion industry or, or bigger. And then I think we'd be we'd be looking at uh, sort of a, even broader contagion into the, the entire economy and not just this pocket of the market. Um, but very similar in, in terms of the deleveraging yeah. and sort of the counterparty risks and everything going on under the surface of, of the crypto market this month. And I think, safe to say, I mean, major rethink about like what is the crypto market what is it supposed to be so many that we've talked to this happened when when i was out in dallas at the insight 2022 event with a panel where we got into the future of money we you know they were two key players within the crypto universe. They were really early in on the game. And so, and they were welcoming uh, regulatory oversight. So that is certainly something at play um, that uh, yeah. maybe will, you know, be yet to come. Did you see Bitcoin, though? It's now below $19,000. $19,000. But then again, to go back 10 years and who would have ever thought it would ever be $19,000? You know, when you started talking and you said financial crisis, I thought, oh my God, did Mike actually buy Bitcoin when it was like <laughs> worth nothing? Because you'd still be doing well then. You'd be talking to me from a castle somewhere in <laughs> yeah. Switzerland. No, I wouldn't be talking. You'd be elsewhere. <laughs> this is Bloomberg.
sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business App, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. First half of the trading year winding down with the Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ all in the red today. Stocks are dropping, bonds are rallying as data showing a slowdown in consumer spending. The main driver of the American economy fuels concern about a recession. S&P now down 27 points, a drop of 7 tenths of 1%. The Dow, which had been down almost 600 points, is lower by 247, a drop right now of 8 tenths of 1%. And NASDAQ is down 118, lower by 1.1%. The 10 year up 30, 30 seconds, 10 year yield 2.97%. Spot gold down 6 tenths of 1%, 1807 the ounce, while West Texas intermediate crude is down 2.7%, 105.73 a barrel. So again, recapping stocks lower, SP down 27, a drop now of 7 tenths of 1%. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, got it, Charlie. Thank you so much. Every time I read about this compo, I think, uh, are they really for real? And apparently they are. And now this novelty rapper and her startup guy husband are facing trial. It all goes back to that $8 billion Bitfinex hack back in August of 2016. It's another great tale in this week's new issue of Bloomberg Business Week, that annual double issue dedicated to tales of robbery, scams, and snitches known as the heist issue. So let's get to it. Joining us is Bloomberg Business Week editor Joel Weber with us on the Access Line in Brooklyn and Bloomberg News Financial Investigations reporter Zeke Fox joining us uh, also from Brooklyn. I got to say, we were reading out lines from this story, Joel, in the newsroom today. Yeah, you're going to you're going to laugh uh, <laughs> because there's there's some great ones and some of them uh, come from Zeke and some of them are just from the story itself because this was bonkers. Kind of felt like it broke the Internet um, <laughs> when the story initially broke earlier this year. And we asked Zeke to kind of just like sink into it and as Zeke does he came back with like the most Zeke possible <laughs> version of a heist story and what was incredible about this is that it might actually be the biggest hack of uh, heist of all time right Zeke how does that how does that happen the next was one of the biggest crypto exchanges in the world in 2016 but like a lot of exchanges it had what appears to be very poor security and Somebody got into the exchange and you stole the passwords to their Bitcoins and transferred out more than half the Bitcoins, more than uh, 100,000 Bitcoins. And for years, it was a mystery what happened. And the value of those Bitcoins rose and rose until at their peak, the missing Bitcoins were worth more than $8 billion. Zeke, I wanted to ask you about the, the two main characters in this story, uh, Heather Morgan, uh, a.k.a. Razzle, Razzle Khan uh, and her husband. Um, you describe uh, what I consider some major crimes against music on her part and, and her rap music. <laughs> <laughs> just, Among other crimes. Just, just awful, awful rap music is, is her claim to fame. But I don't get the... Uh, you know, I, I don't get the opinion that she was a, a, a criminal going into this. She just sort of stumbled into this uh, heist. Yeah, I mean, that was what was so crazy is that in February, out of nowhere, the Department of Justice announced that they'd recovered most of the Bitcoin and arrested two people for money laundering. There's this couple, Heather and Ilya. And Heather, as I said in the story, she's got the rap persona and i was just it struck me i was like could the master thief really be someone who tried to rhyme razzle Khan's the name with that <laughs> hot grandma you really want to bang um, <laughs> that was like, the one i read it, in the newsroom <laughs> yeah i mean it was just it seems so unlikely it's like something you wouldn't believe if someone made it up um and yeah she has like a very standard or not very standard, but her back, nothing about her background suggests that she would get involved in something like this. But the fact is, when they, when the authorities raided their apartment down in the financial district, what they found on the husband's cloud accounts was an encrypted file that contained the passwords to all these stolen Bitcoins. And like in Bitcoin, 
you don't let anyone, whoever controls these uh, private keys, these passwords, controls the coin. So the fact that he's in possession of all the stolen funds is like a strong suggestion that uh, he may have been the one who took them. And the authorities also have evidence that Morgan participated in efforts to move this money and to conceal its origins. So that's why uh, she got arrested, too. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it really is mysterious how uh, if she, these two are, in fact, the hackers, how they got into it. Right. Um, or why they were so, trying, so you, attack, trying to attract so much attention after they had pulled off, like, this crazy crime. So, so yeah, break that down for us, because obviously the, this hack happened a while ago, and then it was sort of this big mystery. And, and what, what was the, the thing that triggered um, authorities becoming uh, increasingly interested? So with Bitcoin, it exists as like an entry on a distributed database. So anyone could look up the addresses where the hackers sent the funds. Like this was public. And they could see that the Bitcoins were in like these numbered addresses, but there's no association with any person. Um, so the problem was that the reputable Bitcoin companies don't want to touch Bitcoins that they know come from a crime, like a hack. So the hackers needed to find some way to move these Bitcoins to someone who didn't care. And they found one place, which was called Alpha Bay, which was a place essentially eBay for like drugs and guns on the dark web. <laughs> and the thinking was that you send the Bitcoins to Alpha Bay and then inside Alpha Bay, all the funds are mixed up. So then when you withdraw the Bitcoins from Alpha Bay to a new address, no one will know that the new address is associated with the hack. Um, the problem was that the authorities, in particular, the cybercrime unit within the IRS, was on like this crazy streak of cracking crypto crimes. And one of the places they went after was Alpha Bay. And after like this raid with the Royal Thai police in uh, Thailand, they were able to get Alpha Bay's computers. And that meant they had all of Alpha Bay's internal records. And they could connect transfers to Alpha Bay with transfers out of Alpha Bay. So transfers that the hackers thought were safe were now... Uh, able to be figured out. But the fact is that there was, this was such a trove of data that the, the authorities were bringing all sorts of cases related to this. And it took them a few years before uh, they realized what they had and were able to gather enough evidence to uh, search Heather and Ilya's apartment. And, and, and Z, quickly, where, where do things stand now? And if there's any uh, uh, leftover Bitcoin hiding somewhere that these two might be able to eventually get to. Where, where might that be? And, and just 40 yeah. seconds, uh, Zeke. So, Ilya is in prison awaiting trial. Heather is out on bail. And there's evidence that they sent some, or whoever had these Bitcoins sent them to another darknet market in Russia called Hydra. And on Hydra, you could pay someone in Bitcoin and have them bury rubles underground for you. And then you could go dig them up later. So they, you never know. They took yeah. a lot of money to Hydra. There could be some bundles of rubles sitting somewhere waiting for Heather and Ilya to come dig them up. I feel like there'll be another Zeke Fox story on this, no doubt about it. But uh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Joel Weber, thank you so much. Editor of Bloomberg Business Week, joining us on the Access Line from Brooklyn. Zeke Fox wrote this story, financial investigations reporter at Bloomberg News on the phone from Brooklyn. It is the annual heist issue. It's a double issue. The stories are just, it was the first story I read this morning with my morning coffee. Uh, so I highly uh, recommend that you check them out. All right, you're listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Coming up, we're going to check out the markets with our TV colleagues. This is Bloomberg Radio.
countdown to the close. Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage ahead of the U.S. market close starts right now. This is down down to the countdown to the close. Ooh, 60 minutes left in the trading session. Caroline Hyde, Romain Bostick, Taylor Riggs, joined now by our colleagues Carol Massa. Mike Regan in the house for Tim Stenovic. We bring together our TV, radio, YouTube audiences to dissect what has been a really rough start to the first half and a pretty rough day to end it. And Caroline, you know who you don't want to be this year? Mm. You don't want to be Netflix. It is the worst performer in the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100 in the first six months of this year. It is down mm. more than 70%. Wow. Uh, we know the woes, right? Back-to-back -back quarterly losses uh, or disappointing reports, I should say, cutting jobs, cracking down on password sharing. They're introducing... We know an ad based subscriber tier. JP Morgan out with a note today saying the focus around the company's ad supported tier has intensified in recent uh, weeks, but it has been a bummer of a year so far for this one, Tim. For Mike. Yeah, and Carol, talk about a wild ride today for the stock market. I mean, we saw the S&P 500 drop uh, more than 2%. It clawed its way all the way back up to unchanged, now down about 0.9%. So really a wild first half to the year. And uh, what more could we expect than a wild day to finish out the first half? Mm -hmm. Well said. Meanwhile, of course, at one point, as we did see, S&P 500 perhaps having its worst half since 1962, now on course in 1970. But look out for that level of 37.64, spot 90. We're currently at 37.84, spot 82. We're down by almost 9 tenths percent. The Dow Jones off by 9 tenths percent. Russell 2000 small caps off by 8 tenths percent. Yeah, laggard, as has been sort of the case over the basically the first half is your big tech down by one and a quarter of a percent, Taylor. It's interesting. We see a little bit of that on the day. You're having utilities, real estate. Those are higher, at least here on the day, when you take a look at some of the individual sectors. That feels a little defensive here. But, Caroline, it's discretionary that's off on the day. You've technology mixed in there. You're off about 1.3%. And it really does bring out the theme, Romaine, of where we're thinking about the safe havens, classic during the pandemic, and unwind of those safety trades, and what is safety going forward. Well, the problem is you're not really finding much utilities and real estate. I mean, Carol, uh, Carol was just talking about uh, Netflix being the worst performer in the S&P 500. And you get to this discussion here about consumer spending. How resilient is it going to be? That Netflix story is not an idiosyncratic story. It is about consumer discretionary spending and the concern uh, that as they introduce that ad tier, maybe even raise prices on the non-ad tier, uh, what's the shakeout from that? How do you value a company like that that isn't growing in the way that it used to grow? We're also going to get some interesting data tomorrow, I believe, when most of the automakers are going to report uh, their deliveries for the second quarter here. Uh, and it's not looking good. Uh, there are a lot of the estimates are that it's going to be down not only for the quarter, but the year-to-date trend right now, right now is well below uh, some of the historical averages. Ford share is down 3% here on the day, down about 46% year-to-date. Mm -hmm. And that consumer spending story, well, last night, of course, we got those RH, that big warning out of RH, the sort of high-end uh, luxury furniture maker. Meanwhile, you have Wayfair, more of a middle-of-the-road furniture maker. Those shares down 8% here on the day. They're down 78, 77, 78% on a year-to-date basis. The concern here is that it's not just whether or not people have the capacity to buy this stuff anymore. It's whether they really want to. And you want to know where people are camping out? There is your utilities at the bottom. Exelon, <laughs> up 2.5% mm -hmm. right now here on the day. Defensive. Meanwhile, what hasn't been, well, your defense, your hedge, has been your bond portfolio. And this is really stark, just the way in which assets have fallen in tandem. Your only glimmer of hope in the first half has really been commodities in the U.S. dollar. Your 60-40 portfolio, so your bonds plus your equities, worst half ever <laughs> on record pretty depressing, which makes you wonder about what's going to happen in the second half. Uh, our day's economic news, that drop in real personal spending in the month of May, our Bloomberg economics team saying, and we also had that revision from January to April, they're saying it's going to be a, a bumpy second half. Also weighing in on the second half was Seema Shah. She's a uh, chief strategist over at Principal Global Investors. She said what she's thinking about we should be getting ready for. Check it out. This is not going to be an easy ride. If anyone thinks that equities can rally to the back of the year, they're making the assumption that the Fed is going to let go of its entire focus on price stability and step back from that. And we have a very different view. We think things are going to get pretty tough. All right, so strap yourself in, everybody. Seema yeah. Shah over Principal Global Investors. Well, I mean, at this point, like, do you write off from me in the second half of the year at well, this point? Well, I mean, Seema makes a good point. I mean, I think her comment was something like everybody thinks that we're going to rally. I was actually mm -hmm. looking at at some of the projections going forward, at least as uh, aggregated by Bloomberg. Uh, 4934, that's the average sort of 12-month price target out there right now uh, for the market. That's about a 29% rally that would be needed to even reach that level. And remember where we were at the start of the year when most of the estimates were for us to finish above 5,000. Uh, 
at the end of the year. So it's only come down slightly from something like 51, 5200 on average now at 4900. If you believe we're getting a 30 percent rally in the second half of this year, I assume there's going to be some pretty big earnings coming through the pipeline that I apparently haven't no noticed or even been telegraphed by any of these companies. Yeah, and Romain, you know, with everyone so worried about inflation, I wanted to bring up the five-year break-even inflation rate. And what that is is basically the bond market's best guess on what inflation will average over the next five years. It's based on the spread between yields on nominal treasuries and inflation-protected treasuries. Yeah, where it's, is it now? It's really come down a lot to about 2.6%, uh, from as high as 3.73%. Now, you know, the, Romain, the bond market doesn't have a, a magic crystal ball, but it does show that bond investors are... Yeah. Pricing in lower Who's inflation. Who's this year? Uh, bond days. investors or equity investors? <laughs> bond no one, investors. No one's looking too smart, I got to say. Uh, dollar investors and commodity dollar investors. investors. There you go. Nicely done. <laughs> Not Bitcoin investors. Um, you guys saw that story on the Bloomberg Terminal about uh, the Atlanta GDP now forecast. Now for the second quarter, they're predicting uh, at least the latest read is down 1%. So put it on top of the decline we saw in the first quarter. So that would technically be potentially a recession. But what's interesting is this number has come down a lot pretty quickly. If you see a chart, you can find it on the Bloomberg Terminal. I mean, you just see how negative the sentiment has gotten when it comes to economic growth. And we get another read on it on Friday. So we'll see what they have to and say. And we got a little bit of a read on it was that real spending number, mm -hmm. of course, declining, as we've been talking about for the first time this year, Caroline, in the face of this higher inflation, and finally a little bit of a softening of the consumer. But is that really actually what Jay Powell wants? He mentioned yesterday, I believe it was, that you have to soften demand to at least let the supply chain give it a chance to catch up a bit. And I suppose what the Atlanta number is reflecting, that pace of sudden deteriorating expectations for the U.S. consumer, for indeed for the U.S. economy, is totally reflected by what Romain, you mentioned earlier the RHs of this world, the, what all started with the snaps of this world, starting to very quickly after a month after earnings, starting to downgrade. And I suppose that's why earnings are going to be so important in the next weeks and months, is just how much we are seeing a deterioration in corporate balance sheets as well. In those corporate balance sheets, and you talk about the idea of pricing power and all the other things that I guess some of these companies have been able to navigate, and you wonder if that gets exhausted and just to what extent. So maybe Jay Powell sort of achieves his main objective, which is to tamp down demand, but the question is, does he, is he going to over shoot here a little bit too much and uh, have some sig significant consequences for the markets. Right. And how much does inflation continue to weigh on purchasing power and consumer demand so that that continues to play out in the second half? All right. We're going to be back in less than an hour's time. We've got more to say. And we're going to, of course, count you down to the close. Our cross-platform coverage on radio, TV, and YouTube. We call it Beyond the Bell. We will count you down to the close on this Thursday. <laughs> You're listening to Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Bloomberg Quick Takes Tim Stenovic on Bloomberg Radio. You are listening to Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Masser along with Mike Regan. He is in for Tim Stenovic on this Thursday. Mike, you've seen a lot of market cycles. I feel like this is like no other. I too have. And it's not like the financial crisis, apples to apples. It's not like the tech bust. I mean, I don't know about you, but I haven't lived through a pandemic uh, where we're trying to figure out where there's so much money was thrown at you know, Main Street in many ways, and then trying to figure out how we come out of it. Yeah, absolutely, Carol. And I think that's the struggle that so many are having on Wall Street. You know, everyone loves to say past performance doesn't guarantee future results. But of course, everyone loves to study the past to try to figure out what's going to happen. And there's just really no playbook for this. There's no historical analog. Um, so I feel like any sort of analysis or, or story that you see saying, well, the last time this happened, this happened, <laughs> really, it just doesn't, doesn't mean as much as it once did. Yeah, I'm curious about what the CEOs are going to ultimately say when they report their earnings, because I think it's so important. Like, if we start to get a lot of CEOs saying, we don't have visibility again, right, which is what they said during the pandemic, if we get a lot of that, or if we get a lot of numbers being brought down, is that reality, or is it a case of CEOs taking advantage of a situation to say, we can bring down these numbers a lot, and we can be really conservative, and maybe set the world up for some surprises later on. I, I think you bring up a great point. I think the only thing maybe more scary than lowered guidance is no guidance. Is right. the CEO saying, you know, throwing up their hands and saying, you got us, uh, you know, <laughs> your guess is as good as ours about what we're going to do. So, I know, uh, right? you know, we'll, we'll have to see. It's going to be a, a fascinating earnings season for sure. Meantime, we heard from Jess Menton that a lot of analysts out there uh, on the sell side are still very optimistic about what we might see for returns for some in individual names. All right, Mike and I are going to continue in a moment. Right now, though, back to World of National News and Nancy Lyons. She is in D.C. Hey, Nance. 
Thanks, Carol. Up until now, President Biden has been reticent to back efforts to eliminate the Senate filibuster and move toward requiring a simple majority for passage of legislation. But that's now changed with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Before leaving the NATO summit in Madrid, Biden said the ruling was not only harmful to Americans, but also damaging to the country's reputation. The one thing that has been destabilizing is the outrageous behavior of the Supreme Court of the United States an overruling not only Roe v. Wade, but essentially challenging the right to privacy. Biden calls the abortion ruling a mistake. He says exceptions should be carved out concerning the filibuster. In its final rulings of the term, the Supreme Court today said the EPA does not have the authority to force power plants to adopt new cleaner technologies to curb greenhouse gases. It's seen as a victory for coal mining companies. Russia has pulled troops from a key island in the Black Sea. Ukraine says its missile and artillery strikes forced the retreat. The Kremlin is calling it a gesture of goodwill to keep grain exports moving. Bloomberg's Maria Today, a reports this could be met with skepticism. The last time Russia says was pulling back troops, it was the Ukrainian capital. It was Kiev. And the reason why that happened is not goodwill or, or the fact that Russians wanted to de-escalate because they've done the opposite. It was the fierce resistance they encountered by the Ukrainian army, which is a professionally trained army now for eight years, and they can put up a fight. We're just learning that Kevin Durant, basketball superstar, has requested a trade out of Brooklyn. That's according to The Athletic. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts. All right, Nance, thank you so much. Carol Masser, along with Mike Regan, we are live on Bloomberg Business Week on Bloomberg Radio and on YouTube. Uh, and one thing we wanted to bring to your attention, because we've talked a little bit about well, a lot, about the market volatility and how that means companies are hesitant to bring companies public. Well, maybe not the case, Mike, when it comes to one company that's backed by Blackstone. We're talking about IBS Software Services. Uh, apparently uh, is considering a US IPO that could value the company at more than $2 billion. This is according to people familiar with the development. Uh, this would defy some concerns about heightened market vol volatility. I mean, your fear is, right, Mike, you bring it out and it does really poorly. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is just a poisonous market environment to try to debut a, a new stock. But hey, look, they're working with uh, Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan Chase, so uh, they're not exactly dealing with the amateurs when it comes to IPOs. So they must, uh, you know, have the confidence to at least consider pulling this off. I mean, it'll be uh, another thing to actually see it priced and, and sort of, uh, you know, whether they really decide to take it to the finish line. Um, but certainly a bold time uh, to try to pull off an IPO. Yeah, apparently. They're working with Goldman. They're working with J.P. Morgan uh, for the plan first-time share, according to those in the know. IBS Software has filed confidentiality for, or confidentially, excuse me, excuse me, for that U.S. IPO. Could happen as soon as this year. Companies considering seeking at least another 500 million in the offering. Again, uh, according to those in the know, uh, Blackstone announced back in 2015 it would buy a minority stake in IBS Software for 170 million. So, Mike, that would be about seven years, right? Looking to turn it. And make some money. Yeah, yeah. So a, kind that of a long. Pretty normal though, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah well, long. So it can be long. You know, it depends. But uh, you know, and for anyone wondering what this company does, they actually make software for airlines, logistics, and hospitality companies. So that's mm. kind of an interesting angle too. Not exactly, uh, you know, industries that have been booming lately. So maybe, maybe that's part of the story is that you know they're expecting this reopening, uh, you know, excitement to to eventually help a company that's that's uh, dealing software in this space. Yeah, that. That is interesting, right, in terms of the play. All right, folks, Carol Master, Mike Regan, this is Bloomberg.
news, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. 43 minutes to go until we wrap up the quarter and the first half of the trading year with the Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ all in the red. Right now, we've got the S&P down 1.4%. Lots going on. Let's head right over to the first word breaking news desk for today's afternoon call. Here he is, Bill Maloney. And good afternoon, Charlie. U.S. stocks are back under pressure after a rebound off the morning lows. Dow's back down 400 points. S&P's drop 52, and NASDAQ is lower by 200 points. The U.S. 10-year yield drops to 2.97%. Gold is down 11, oil is in the red, and Bitcoin is down by 6%. Among the main 11 S&P sectors, only utilities were in the green. And leaders to the upside on the Dow, Travelers and Procter & Gamble, while Walgreens fell 6.5% after earnings and led to the downside. Also after earnings, Constellation Brands fell 5%. And in other news, Reuters said that Facebook is bracing for a leaner second half of the year. Wrapping things up, Micron reports after the bell. Live from the first of breaking news desk, I'm Bill Maloney. Charlie? Okay, we thank you very much, Bill, and to hear live breaking news over your Bloomberg type squawk S Q U A W K on your terminal. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. It is indeed. Thank you so much, Charlie. Well, we often talk about fundamentals when it comes to Tesla. We talk about the latest comments by uh, its commander-in-chief and its founder, Elon Musk. Today, we wanted to really zero in on the stock. It's down about 45% from its all-time high back in November of 2021. This year alone, shares are down roughly 35%. Bloomberg Equity Markets reporter Esha Day writes about how Tesla's $350 billion wipeout in the first half opens a door for the brave. She joins us in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Store uh, studio. She's there with uh, Mike. All right. How, I mean, you got to be pretty brave, right? <laughs> How brave does one have to be to, to buy uh, Tesla at these levels, Sasha? Yeah, and thanks for having me. Uh, pretty brave, as, <laughs> as Carol, uh, Carol rightly mentioned. I mean, we have seen the stock um, fall 35% this year. That's like a $350 billion wipeout, right? And uh, there's a lot of trouble brewing. Uh, we are seeing the company really struggling with uh, supply chain shortages, uh, raw material cost inflation. Uh, the bear market is really weighing on the valuation, the, the fear of recession is uh, really kind of weighing on, on the stock because, you know, cars at the end of the day are a consumer discretionary product. So, you know, if consumer is squeezed, it's definitely going to be a, um, a pressure on the, on the demand for it. And then on top of it, we also have Musk and its deal um, and, and his uh, plan to buy Twitter, which is uh, really weighing on investor sentiment who's worried that He's probably uh, spreading himself a little too thin mm -hmm. between um, too many high-profile projects. So yeah, I mean, if you if you want to buy this dip, you'll have to be pretty brave. Right, Tesla, SpaceX, Twitter. I imagine he wants to tweet from outer space someday. I think that's the ultimate goal in, in a Tesla car. But Esha, um, so Tesla's famous for being sort of a, a very richly valued stock. I'm wondering what um, this wipeout in the share price this year has done to those valuations and how it sort of compares to the old uh, legacy car makers like Ford and, and General Motors. Well, um, you know, if you compare to the legacy car makers, it's still pretty, pretty, pretty steep, right? I mean, Tesla right now, despite all the wipeout, it's valued at about $700 billion. Um, if you look at Ford and GM, that's there about around $45 billion each. So the main question, the main debate here really is... Uh, can, how should Tesla be valued, right? Should it be valued like a car maker? Should it be valued like a technology company? Or should it be like some sort of a mix, exotic mix of both uh, valuations? And then you come up with $700 billion. Um, when I speak to investors who are kind of looking at or focused at like a five-year time horizon for Tesla, they say that all the risks that I just talked about, uh, the supply chain um, issues, the recession issues, um, you know, 
this uh, uncertainty about Twitter, these are all real risks, but at the same time, they're also transitory. So if you s look over the past six months, uh, nothing fundamentally has really changed for them when they look at Tesla. Uh, the EV revolution, they believe, is still coming. Uh, Tesla still is a company that they ha think has the ability to innovate, um, and they are willing to pay this premium for Tesla. I Go ahead, Mike. No, please. No, I was going to say, so the true believers are, are still on board, but I wonder, um, are there ranks thinning, do you think? Are some of your calls going unanswered when you're trying to find <laughs> Tesla bulls? You know, or, uh, Sorry, he uh, he's out of the office right now. Indeed. I mean, it definitely takes, <laughs> I go back to that word, they're brave. It definitely takes <laughs> a brave soul now to come out and really uh, you know, raise your flag high and say that I'm still a Tesla bull. But still, I mean, there are people out there. And essentially, their main argument here is that fundamentally, we haven't seen a lot change over the past six months. So, you know, if this is uh, like a 30 percent dip, 35 percent dip, uh, go in and buy it. You know, it is interesting. Like, I'm just pulling up the DES pages on Tesla and on General Motors. And when you look at, you know, the PE or the forward PE, it's just a completely different world. And, it, and you're right. It gets to what do we think of Tesla is, you know, is it a technology company that deserves those higher valuations? It, you know, a growth company. I mean, if we believe the world is pivoting towards EVs and Tesla will continue to be a main player, then maybe they will grow in ultimately, you know, into that valuation. Indeed, yeah, and and that's what I think of the long-term investors are really betting on. As one of the investors I spoke to, he mentioned that you know, for example, you have this Optimus uh, robot thing. We haven't really seen much of it still, right? And he himself, being a, an ardent follower, is saying that you know, there's probably like one in ten a chance that it really w works or becomes like a commercially viable uh, technology. But if it does, hmm. uh, then it would be massive, and that's what they're in for. In for better or worse, I suppose. I've noticed uh, Elon Musk hasn't tweeted in a while. I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if that's getting uh, anyone spooked. Or maybe it's a good thing uh, for Tesla shareholders if he spends less time on Twitter. I don't know. I, I, I think people generally agree that it's definitely good for volatility, at least, for the yeah. stock, which, which <laughs> definitely spooks some investors. It's not, it's, again, it's not for everybody, well, and that's something even long-term investors. Say. You know, and it's, it's interesting. It goes back to, to, Mike, I think, of the discussion we had with Jess Metton. Um, if I look at analysts, 25 buys, 12 holds, 11 sells. So there's still, you know, actually, there's still overwhelmingly the analyst community likes this name. It's not like they're bailing out and just got about 20 seconds. Yes, no, and that's absolutely right. Of course, there's, you know, a larger conversation to be had about mm -hmm. how Wall Street analysts generally have been slow this year in catching up with, uh, you know, the, the Reality? conversation. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's another word for it. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but no, it looks like, you know, if you look at the average price target, which is around $900, that, that seems like uh, Tesla is in for about 30% rise in the stock price from where it is yeah. currently over the next 12 months. I would never count... Elon out, at least not yet. Uh, Asha Day, Equity Markets Reporter at Bloomberg News. Shares of Tesla, by the way, just down about 2% in today's trade. This is Bloomberg.
broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. All right, Michael Regan, this is a quiz, not the Bloomberg quiz, but a quiz anyway. Uh, what stock was up almost 7% today and then also down more than 4% at its lows? I think all of them at one point. Was it? <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. No. Um, we're going to talk Bed Bath & Beyond because it has had quite a swing today. In fact, it's pretty much flat right now, but... Uh, Investors, man, try to figure this one out. Yeah. We're going to talk about it in just a moment. All right, let's get a check on the trading day once more because we've got, Charlie, we're ticking down 29 minutes here. Indeed, until we wrap up not only the quarter but also the first half. The year just flying right by and red on the screen right now. S&P bouncing off the bottom but still down 29 points, down by about 8 tenths of 1%, extending the year-to-date loss to 20.4% on the S&P. The Dow right now down 240, have been down almost 600 down now by uh, eight-tenths of 1%. The NASDAQ Composite Index down 125, drop there of 1.1%. Tenure up 30, 30 seconds. Tenure yield 2.97%. Spot gold 18.07 the ounce, down uh, $10 the ounce, now down by six-tenths of 1%. West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil down 3.5%, 105.87 a barrel. A view that central banks need to act fast because they misjudged inflation is roiling markets. Traders are ramping up up bets the economy will buckle under aggressive tightening. Seema Shaw is chief strategist at Principal Global Investors in London. They've finally emphasized, and especially for the Fed, they finally emphasized that price stability has to be their number one priority. And I think for markets, so I've given a bit of a wake-up call, this is not going to be an easy ride. If anyone thinks that equities can rally to back of the year, they're making the assumption that the Fed is going to let go of its entire focus on price stability and step back from that. And we have a very different view. We think things are going to get pretty tough. Delta Airlines CEO Ed Bastian has apologized to customers for an unacceptable level of canceled and delayed flights, an unusual step that reflects mounting frustration among waylaid summer travelers. Delta shares, uh, they're down by 2.2% right now. American Airlines down 2.8%. Uh, United down 9 tenths of 1%. Southwest down 1 tenth of 1%. JetBlue is down now by 6.2%. The Dow, the S&P, NASDAQ are all declining. Right now, again, we have got uh, the 10 year yield 2.97%. Bed Bath and Beyond shares are virtually flat on the day, down one tenth of 1%. And that's a Bloomberg business flash. Charlie, did you see that? A little bit of buying here. Trying, yeah, I'm looking, right? I'm, I'm, I'm running obviously the GIP screen like cool. you guys are on the Bloomberg. And yeah. yes, we're bounce off the bottom here. All right, good stuff. Charlie, thank you so much. Well, we talked about Tesla. We mentioned that we're going to have another specific stock we want to talk about, and that's Bed Bath and Beyond. I have to tell you, Mike, that for loyal listeners, of Bloomberg Business Week. They know I have kind of this love-hate with Bed Bath & Beyond. <laughs> I've shopped there. Like, you can go for quick things. You know exactly what you're going to get. You get the little bottles if you want to travel. But for me, I also, like, I walk through and then I feel like it's a maze. I can never, like, find my way back. So <laughs> that's my love-hate. Um, and I feel like investors right now finding it really hard to love this name. I mean, stock's down something like 65% so far this year. 36%, Mike, of the outstanding floats being shorted. Wow. That is an unloved stock, right? Yeah, but also maybe ripe for a, for a squeeze at some point. But I, I get what you mean about that. It's like <sighs> Ikea. You know, you go oh. in. There's only one way out. You got to, you know, go through the maze. And, yeah. Yeah. Is it because your shopping cart becomes much more full than, than you had <laughs> planned when you when you started? I don't know. I don't know. I know. I can never, like, find the meatballs, like, if I'm trying to go back at <laughs> Ikea. All right. Let's bring in Bloomberg News retail reporter Allison Nicole Smith sitting by patiently on the phone in New York City. So, Allison, love your read. Stick a fork in them. And I feel like it, you know, call it done when it comes to Bed Bath & Beyond. So what is it? Investors certainly seem to be like, I don't know. I'm done with this one. What about the analyst community? That's, thank you so much for having me, and that's an excellent question. So the consensus among analysts, I mean, one of the biggest concerns is liquidity among them. Um, the, and recently we saw the exit of Bed Bath & Beyond CEO, and, you know, this whole thing for the last two years is, you know, Bed Bath & Beyond is, you know, it's struggling, it's going to turn itself around, so they brought in this hotshot um, executive from Target who strategies worked well over there and was supposed to work well at the Bethion. But, you know, if the yesterday's news and the current stock is any indication, 
that's not really true. And analysts are saying, are expressing concern that, you know, we've heard this through before, that they're going to turn themselves around. And, like, can they actually? You know, a year ago they had $1 billion in free cash flow, and now they're down to about $100 million. Mm, so That's just yeah. one year. Yeah, so you that's just a lot. You can't turn yourself around, Carol, when you have to keep walking through the, through the maze <laughs> to, right. to get... I think they need to bring Carol in as a consultant on, on this. <laughs> But, but Alison, I'm wondering, you know, I, I also noticed um, uh, the arrival, dun, 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 of an activist shareholder, uh, Ryan Cohen. And you describe him uh, as uh, having some Reddit reading fans, which um, of, cor of course makes me fascinated. Is he taking to Wall Street bets or, or something to try to try to drum up some support here? What's going on with this, uh, this activism campaign? Yeah, so basically Cohen has a 9.7% stake in Bed Bessie and beyond his firm. And so there's a lot at stake for him here um, in terms of the success of Bed Bath and Beyond. But basically what he's been pushing for is, you know, he believes the bye-bye baby unit of Bed Bath and Beyond is a great asset. And he's been pushing for the company to sell it. Um, and he's also, according to sources familiar with his thinking, he pushed for the CEO's departure and sees it as an opportunity to, you know, uh, wipe the slate clean and uh, undo the mistakes um, that the CEO made um, over the last few years. And, um, but, you know, the problem here is going to be convincing investors that the company can still work the ship. Yeah, I do feel like you bring in an activist investors, right? You start poking the bear a little bit, uh, poking the company, and you start to get things changed. But it doesn't always necessarily, you know, result in a good outcome. I mean, in terms of retail, this is your world, Allison. I mean, does the world need a Bed Bath & Beyond? I mean, I used it a ton for when my daughter went off to college. There was just everything, you, <laughs> you, know, you know, right? In, like, you just did it. You put it in the basket. You picked it up at the store. Used the coupons. Yep. It was perfect. But to be honest, uh, I don't go there other like regularly. Yeah, and is Amazon at play here too? Are people just right. going to Amazon for, for this stuff? Well, exactly. I mean, to your point, Carol, what you said earlier about you know these kind of like uh, confusing, <laughs> crowded maze of aisles. Um, that was one of the problems uh, Trying was supposed to fix, and he did. He um, uh, cleaned things up, and that was a great measure, according to analysts I've spoken to. Um, but it apparently wasn't enough. He also tried to roll out private label brands. That was something he did at Target, but and it attracted customers. But it apparently wasn't the case here because Bed Bath and Beyond has seen persistent sales slumps throughout his three-year tenure. And so, to your point about this increasingly competitive landscape, that's why Bed Bath and Beyond is losing its edge. You know, it's dealing with competition from Amazon, from Home Goods, from Wayfair. Um, yeah. And so that's it's lost its relevancy among customers and that's a tough thing to win back. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, right? And you just, you see how this stock is just, I mean, it used to be a $52 stock back in early 2021, and now it's like five bucks. So. Well, Carol, I've got a kid going to college, <laughs> and I'll tell you, I'm coming to the rescue. We, I think all her gift cards for high school graduation were to Bed Bath & Beyond. The so. mattress we'll protectors, <laughs> the big mattress, the big sheets. All right, we got to run. Allison, thanks. Allison Nicole Smith, retail reporter at Bloomberg News, back to D.C., and Nancy Lyons. Hey, Nance. Thanks, Carol. President Biden says he would support changing the Senate's filibuster rules to pass legislation ensuring privacy rights and access to abortion. We have to codify Roe v. Wade in the law, and the way to do that is to make sure that Congress votes to do that. And if the filibuster gets in the way, it's like voting rights, it should be, we provide an exception. Biden, speaking at the end of a NATO summit in Madrid, says the U.S. has been a world leader in terms of personal rights and privacy, and he views the Supreme Court ruling as a mistake. In another blow to Biden's policies, today the Supreme Court restricted the EPA's ability to curb greenhouse gas emissions from plow power plants. Brandon Barnes is with Bloomberg Intelligence. Basically what the court said is, you know, EPA, you tried to go too far when you were pushing the states to generation shift. You were trying to push the states away from those fuel sources into renewables, into other ways to do this. Bloomberg's Brandon Barnes, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote that Congress needs to speak more explicitly to give the agency more power. The ruling does cast doubt on Biden's pledge to reduce U.S. emissions in half by the end of the decade. Brooklyn Nets superstar Kevin Durant is seeking a trade, this according to The Athletic. Nets GM Sean Marks is reportedly working with Durant and his business manager to find a new team for the star. 
This news comes just hours before free agency opens. Durant was signed to the Nets during the 2019 offseason and has four more years on his contract. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. All right, Nancy Lyons, thank you so much. Nancy Lyons with World of National News in her 99.1 Newsroom in Washington, D.C. Mike, uh, Mike Regan, how's your family office doing? <laughs> My family office? <laughs> well, it's one day I'm in the office, actually. I'm not, I'm not at the family <laughs> office in uh, New Jersey. But uh, great story about uh, some of city family offices, clients, what they're doing. You know, Carol, it's a fascinating space. You know, uh, mm -hmm. years ago, a lot of big hedge funds got tired of all the regulation and the red tape. They decided to go to family offices. And then we never really heard much about them again. So this story giving us some insights on what they've been up to. Well, and this is, I'm always curious about this too, because does it, you know, what do they know maybe as they look at the markets? And they tend to have a, you know, different investment object, object, objectives or timeframes tend to be longer. But um, what we're finding out by our Ben Stupples is family offices with at least a billion in assets are boosting their investments amid market swings fueled by the recent geopolitical and macroeconomic turbulence. This is coming from a Citigroup executive. And here's a quote, Luigi uh, Pierini, I believe it is, head of Europe, Middle East, and Africa at City Global Wealth says, some of our very large family office clients are taking advantage of the volatility. They're taking quote unquote big positions across all asset classes, fixed right. income and foreign exchange, that right. includes. And for the record, my family office does not have <laughs> at least a billion <laughs> in assets. We are taking no big big positions. But you know, this story scares me a little bit, Carol. Right. I tend to get scared easy, but um, this is kind of scary when you think back to Archegos, mm. uh, a famous family office that took big, quote unquote, big positions, a little too big, and really uh, just ended poorly. And I think that's kind of the, the worry with these type of operations. You know, they don't have uh, investors to push back. Uh, I get the impression that they probably don't have as robust of a risk management uh, process in place that a hedge fund would. So, you know, they're, they're able to sort of make these big moves. And I guess best, best of luck to them is, is all I'd say. Yeah, exactly. A recent UBS Group uh, survey found that 221 single family offices with assets under management totaling $258.8 billion had about 4% of their assets on average in hedge funds at the end of last year. So I don't think I have any assets in hedge funds. <laughs> <laughs> That's two of us. That makes
sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pella. 13 minutes to go until we wrap up the first half of the trading year. Year to date, the S&P is down 20.4%. Today, the S&P is down 28 points, down 7 tenths of 1%. The Dow is down 211, have been down almost 600, a recovery of sorts, but still in the red. The Dow now down by 6 tenths of 1%. The Nasdaq Composite Index down 115, drop there of 1%. The 10-year yield, 2.9%. 9% right now, below 3% on the 10-year. Spot gold down $9 the ounce to 18.08. And West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil, 105.88 a barrel, drop right now of 3.6%. Among the names reporting after the close of trading today will be Micron Technology. Micron shares ahead of that report down by 7 tenths of 1%. Recapping, stocks lower, S&P down 27, a drop right now of 7 tenths. I'm Charlie Peloton. That is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Thank you so much, Charlie Pellet. All right, it is 349 on Wall Street. The following is an editorial from Bloomberg Opinion. This editorial was written by the Bloomberg Editorial Board. In broad outline, the events of January 6, 2021 have been clear for some time, yet the details still have the power to shock. So it was Tuesday when a White House aide delivered explosive testimony before the House committee investigating the riot. Whether Trump broke the law will be a matter for the Justice Department. But for now, it's worth remembering those who acted with propriety in the months after the 2020 election, including on the day of the riot. At every level, from local lawmakers to federal judges, there were people in consequential positions who did the right thing. Their commitment to democracy ensured that the system mostly held up in the end. That's a low bar, to be sure, but it's nonetheless a fitting rejoinder to the most lawless and reckless presidency in memory. This editorial was written by the Bloomberg Editorial Board. For more Bloomberg Opinion, please go to Bloomberg.com slash opinion or O-P-I-N go on the Bloomberg Terminal. This has been Bloomberg Opinion. I'm driving in my car. I turn on how about you let me drive? Oh, no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive home. Excuse me, I wanna drive. You drive, stay in prison. It's a good question. Who is the driver? 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 Yes, indeed. Just about ten and a half minutes, and then we will be wrapping up the second quarter as well as the first half of 2022. Bouncing around uh, in today's trade, we're definitely off our lows of the session, but also off our highs. But uh, we've seen pretty much, I think, red for almost all of the day here, uh, or most of the day. So let's get to it, and let's get to our drive to the close guest. Brent Schutte is back with us, Chief Investment Officer at Northwestern Mutual Wealth Management, roughly $237 billion in assets under management. And he joins us on the phone in Milwaukee. Hey, uh, Brent, it's good to have you here with Mike Regan and myself. Uh, we've got a story on the Bloomberg today. We just, Mike and I just talked about it about Citi's uh, family office clients, those with over a billion in assets. They're boosting their investments amid the market volatility, all asset classes. What big positions are your uh, clients taking amid uh, the big market uh, moves that we've been seeing? Well, I don't know if we've necessarily changed our big positions. We have owned commodities and gold and things that go up when inflation goes up, and that's been a hedge that we've had in our portfolios for some time. I guess the thing that I would advise individual investors not to do is sell based upon what has happened, because I do think the second half will be much better than the first half. Look, the biggest why question out there is... What, why oh, do you think ahead. it's going to be better in the second half? Because I, I think the big fear out there right now, so we, we do swing back and forth between recession and inflation fears. I think the, the big news, the big fear that's out there is that this is somehow like the 1970s. Uh, in that even though demand is going to fall, which undoubtedly it's going to fall, the big fear is that inflation won't fall with it. And I don't think that's the case. I think you're already starting to see signs of inflation pulling back. The market is already showing you that they believe it's going to pull back. And I think that backdrop will lead to a stronger second half for stocks because we won't have to worry about the Fed continuing to hike us so far into a recession. 
Um, we certainly could have a recession, but it would be very, very mild. And I think the market's already discounted that. You know, Brent, uh, inflation can be such a tricky thing to forecast and predict. Uh, I'm wondering what sort of signals you're looking at. I mean, obviously, we've had commodities uh, from the index level come off their highs. I was talking about break-even inflation rates in the bond market. They're also suggesting, at least you know, for the next five years or so, uh, expectations are coming down. How, how are you going about uh, wrapping your head around what to expect with inflation for the rest of the year? Yeah, so I, I do think you're seeing a few reasons why it should fall. First of all, you're seeing that uh, shift from uh, goods spending to service sector spending at the same time that you've rebuilt goods inventories. And so if you look at the components of the PCE, the really, really odd parts are the goods parts of the equation. And those are going to start pulling back because you've had inventories rebuilt and the consumer isn't going to continue to spend in the same way they did on goods because they pulled that forward during COVID. That's point number one. Point number two, I, I do think the demand destruction that is occurring right now you mentioned some of them, is causing commodity prices to roll over, which will actually also have a positive impact on uh, inflation. And so I look at container rates. Everybody was talking about those earlier this year. We kind of forgot about those things. They're 32% off their highs. The Baltic dry index is 62% off its highs. Lumber is 57% off its highs. Commodities in general are 13% off its highs. Oil has fallen 15% off its highs. Uh, and you mentioned market expectations. And so I think when you combine those two things with inflation expectations, which is where the Fed got worried, the Fed was worried that the, the, the temporary or transitory or whatever the word may be, the supply and demand imbalances, they were worried that would become permanent because people started believing it was permanent. Right. Uh, and that's why they went faster. And that's been tamped down quite a bit, too. Uh, and so I think you're going to see that come down. And I think you're going to have a better second half because of that. You know, Brent, it's funny. It seems like almost everyone I talk to or everyone I read about uh, from the buy side thinks that analysts are just out to lunch these days and that those earnings forecasts, you know, double digit earnings forecasts for the rest of the year have only one way to go. I wonder how, you know, are you in that camp that thinks, you know, analysts are sort of late to pick up on the damage being done to the economy? And, you know, the other flip side of the coin is, well, companies tend to almost always beat these expectations. So where do you see that sort of equilibrium between what analysts expect, uh, what the market expects them to do with, with estimates and, and where we'll end up? Yeah, and this is where I don't even know if I have a have to forecast that. I, I think they will come down. But this is where we've been talking about for the prior six, nine, 12 months to be in things that are cheaper and where expectations aren't stretched. And right. So if I look at the NASDAQ, I believe NASDAQ earnings are expected to be up 60% year over year uh, in, uh, for 2022. I think the chances of that happening are probably somewhere around at zero. Um, <laughs> but if you look at things like uh, U.S. small caps, and I talk about the S&P 600, they traded 11 times their 2022 expected earnings. Even if I cut those 20, 30 percent, they are still cheap on an absolute basis compared to their history, and on a relative basis other, to other parts of the market. And that's where I would continue to focus my capital on things that are cheap. And I'm going to take you way back in time and have a margin of safety uh, versus uh, decreased expectations. What's the biggest risk for investors right now? Panicking. <laughs> I guess you're talking about individual investors. I mean, we talk about this every single time that you shouldn't sell when others do. And yet every single time investors find a new reason why they believe it's different. Uh, and I still haven't found one that's actually um, different uh, in my time of doing this, which is now 27 years. Look, I, I think the big uh, risk still is um, certainly what's happening in Russia and Ukraine and energy prices and, and how long those stay where they're at. And, and are we, you know, typically are we going to be in more of an energy shock for some period of time? That certainly has had a staying power on inflation so far. Um, but I think you're starting to see everything else kind of depreciate around it, which I think is a good news for inflation. But certainly that is still one of the bigger risks that's out there. I think, you know, we've seen a lot of wealth uh, d destroyed, I think, in the crypto area. I've seen quite a bit. That certainly um, is some sort of a risk, too. Um, but I think that's actually helping to bring inflation right now, which actually has a silver lining to it. Hey, Brett, how about over in the bond market? You know, we have seen 10-year yields kind of come back down below 3% uh, today. But, boy, if it, we went back in time a few years and I told you you could get almost 3% on a 10-year Treasury, I think a lot of people would have, uh, you know, jumped out of their seat for that. Is, <laughs> you know, is there value there now or, or, or what? Are you more excited about stocks as, as far as a 60-40 type of split? Would you be going 70-30 or 50-50? You know, what's the, the sort of relative attractiveness between? the two? Well, I think the good news now is that bonds are more of a hedge against uh, portfolio deterioration than they were, uh, you know, six, 12 months ago when they yielded basically nothing. And you've had that rate shock that hasn't uh, happened. You know, we've taken the 10-year treasury from what, 50 basis points of, uh, a year or so ago, or maybe a little bit more than that, um, 150 at the end of the year up to 3%. 
So I think they are a hedge against that. I'm more excited on the equity side, but I think bonds are, are much more exciting than they used to be. Uh, and we continue to focus on higher quality bonds. Uh, and we do still own commodities. And we've talked a lot in the past about having a third asset class because it was a belief of ours that at some point you might see the stock and bond market move together because those two things have been tied at the hip from a valuation perspective. If you recall, we all talked about Tina. There is no alternative. Right. Uh, and kind of what the Fed was doing, backstopping risk. The Fed and QE wanted you to actually, uh, they were taking treasuries off your balance sheet, pushing rates low so that you'd take risk. And now we're unwinding that. And so I still think those three asset classes in a 60-40 um, still belong. Uh, but we are a, a bit more excited on the equity side of the equation, but certainly bonds at this point are, are, are a better hedge, and there's still something right. that you should own. Got to run. Hey, Brent, thank you. thank you. Have a good holiday. Brent Schutte over at Northwestern Mutual Wealth Management. All right, it's time to head over to our TV colleagues for Beyond the Bell. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now, we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romaine Bostic, Caroline Hyde, Taylor Riggs counting you down to the closing bell. Here to help take us beyond the bell, it's our global simulcast. We're joined right now by Carol Masser and Mike Regan in for Tim Stenovic. Today, we welcome our audiences across Bloomberg Television, Radio, and YouTube. And Carol, uh, we were looking last year, 2021, a 27% gain on the S&P 500. Here in the first half, at the end of the first half of 2022, we've erased all of those gains here uh, a massive drawdown here in the first half of the year. It looks like it's going to be one of the worst first halves going back to the 1970s. Romain, who would have thunk, right, at the end of last year or late last year that this is where we would be, which also just reminds me how quickly market sentiment can change. And we've had some key reasons why. Of course, the war over in Ukraine and other factors continued inflationary pressures. But it is something, Mike, that I have to kind of remember that markets have cycles. They go up, the, they go down, and they can change very quickly. Right. And Carol, of course, I think the, the one thing to always think about in, uh, you know, the end of a quarter, end of a first half like this is what is all the portfolio rebalancing doing? Is it exaggerating moves uh, one way or the other? We saw that big rally last week that might have been people sort of getting back into stocks to get those 60-40 portfolios back to where they should be. Now we're back down. I think maybe, uh, fingers crossed, we'll get a clearer idea of sentiment once we get to the end yeah. of this quarter and into the next one. Just trying to go through some of the benchmarks that did do well in the green. I mean, of course, you've got a lot of FX exposure in any of these plays, but Argentina did well, up 6%. Panama did well, Romain, Chile did well, Portugal over in Europe did well. Portugal, yeah, I mean, look, I mean, there are, I mean, we make a lot of jokes here, but there are, of course, a lot of opportunities out there. And you even talk about uh, some of the softness we've been seeing late, lately in the commodities, at least over the last few weeks. But if you had, like, bought into some of these commodities at the start of the year, uh, you're probably having one of your best returns that you've seen in quite some time. Here are the numbers here on a daily basis, and I guess we'll give them to you on a year-to-date basis as well. The Dow Jones Industrial Average down about eight-tenths of a percent here on the day is down about 15 percent on a year-to-date basis. The S&P 500 down about nine-tenths of a percent on the day, down 21 percent from the start of the year. And the Nasdaq Composite going to finish the day down about 1.3 percent. It's down 29.5. We'll just round that 30 percent drop here on a year-to-date basis. The Russell 2000 going to finish the day down by about seven-tenths of a percent. It's down about 24 percent on a year-to-date basis. You know, we're taking, you know, a lot of a perspective here, right, looking at what happened in the first half of the year. I was looking at the Baltic Dry Index. We were just talking about it with our market guest. I mean, this is down about 35 percent in the past month alone. So an idea of, you know, what it costs in terms of shipping. And so it's just another indicator of kind of the negative sentiment, Taylor, that is out there, especially when it comes to the outlook. We've certainly seen that for the year. You're seeing a little bit of that on the day, on sort of big days like today where we want to put things into perspective. I also wanted to refocus again on what we are seeing on the day. A little bit of red, even in the, quote, best performers for our radio audience. Carol, this feels really sort of defensive, right? Utilities, household products, goods, capital goods, you're up anywhere from one half to 1.2% or so on the day. You go down to the bottom, you're getting software and services, technology, media, energy, autos. Those are off anywhere from about one and a half to more than 2% or so on the day as well. Energy, as we know, has been a big winner for the year. A little bit of that unwinding today. All right, so let's get to some specific uh, names when it comes to gaining in today's session. So Costco, I think you might have uh, highlighted this earlier, Romaine. This was among the top in the NASDAQ 100 and the S&P 500. Yeah. Uh, J.P. Morgan Intrepid Growth Fund boosting its holdings in Costco, reduced its holdings in Lowe's. You might remember earlier this month, the company came out with May comp sales that were really way above 
of estimates. Stock is still down, though, uh, pretty significantly for the year. Also want to mention Exelon EXC is the ticker, and this one is up about 2.2% in today's trade, gaining despite UBS lowering its price target to 49 from 54 a share, the stock closing at 45 and change. They did maintain their buy rating. Related news, let's not forget the Supreme Court rulings. They're wrapping up today. Uh, the Supreme Court limiting the EPA's role in controlling emissions at power plants and combating climate change. So some flexibility for the energy industry. So we did see some move in some of those utilities. And then I just wanted to mention Spirit Airlines. Save is the ticker. This stock up yeah. another 6.4% in today's trade, officially delaying that yeah. plan vote on the proposed major uh, merger, excuse me. Frontier, Frontier, though, saying it's going to continue to talk with uh, uh, both of their suitors, including JetBlue. Uh, it does favor, though, Spirit, uh, I should say, favors Frontier. Yeah, Carol, let me tell you about some of the big movers on the downside today. Obviously, a, a down day, and some of the stocks leading the way. We've got Walgreen Boots uh, down about more than 7%. Interestingly, because the company did maintain its guidance for 2022 earnings, uh, beat estimates for the fiscal third quarter. But the big story is really uh, investors questioning their strategy after it abandoned its planned sale of the UK Boots chain. That was expected to bring yeah. in more than $6 billion. Uh, we also have G. GM uh, stock down about 5%. There's a little bit of news there. Reuters said it called off its plan to sell its Indian plan. Uh, but also, I think uh, the, the story we have out is just that recession concerns are front and center, uh, especially for investors in automobile stocks. That's probably uh, a similar story with one of the other big movers, which is Caesars, the yeah. uh, casino chain. They're down about 5.3%. Nasty year for that stock, down 60%. This even after uh, Las Vegas reported that uh, May gambling revenue on the Strip rose almost 12%. Yeah. There's another story, Romain, about... Uh, yeah. I'm just going to interrupt you real quick, quick here, Mike. Uh, just uh, kind of... We need to get back to uh, some of the superlatives here. Uh, just to recap real quick, the NASDAQ 100 uh, finishing the first half down 30%. Now, that's the biggest decline that we've seen going back to 2002, the course of superlative we've been talking about all day on the S&P 500. Worst first half decline going back to 1970 here. Uh, some of the individual movers, you talk about Tesla having its worst quarter ever. Amazon dropped the deepest since 2001. And Caroline, this sell-off that we've seen here in the U.S., it isn't confined to the U.S. This was global in nature. It was. Look at the yeah. stock benchmarks when you look at GMM. Look at this beautiful summation of just how ugly the first half of the year was. S&P 500 off by 21% if you round it up. Canada, the index there, off by 11%. It was ugly over in Asia. You saw 16% sell-off in Europe. If I'm looking at a currency perspective, look, the only area of green from the, you're looking at your G10 currencies, the only area of strength, up 7%. The U.S. dollar index, really, yen, I mean, extraordinary weakness being shown in the Japanese yen, which lost some 20, 18% of its value versus the U.S. dollar. British pound weakening to the tune of 10%. In fact, we saw the absolute light in green, which was commodities. But even remember, on this month, we've got the first time oil is falling in this year on a monthly basis because we start to see OPEC Plus, for example, saying, committing that they're going to be increasing supply. But on the year thus far, Brent crude up 40%, WTI crude up 40%. Don't even get us started on what gas oil has done up 76%, what natural gas in the US is up 50%. It's doubled over in Europe. And Taylor, it's been a story of absolute <laughs> soaring yields in Australia to Canada to Sweden to Singapore, Asia, Europe. And you tell us about the US. That is like a Christmas light show, Caroline, <laughs> behind you. Take a look here, and I want to do some size and scope when you think about a two-year yield. We started the year with a two-year yield at 75 basis points. We jumped to 350, and we've climbed our way back to 297. That really shows sort of the influence of this Federal Reserve, the narrative, the hawkishness has had on this market. We also want to look at the 10-year yield. We started it this year at about a 155, again, jumping to 350, falling all the way back to about a 302 here briefly seeing an inverted yield curve that we have this year briefly of course jumping back below that three percent level i think as we pivot to yields and we talk about the fed the weakening demand environment that's one thing we're hearing out of micron um falling here in after hours talking about some big weakness that they're seeing on the horizon Really in that forward forecast, Caroline, uh, looking at fourth quarter adjusted revenue, 6.8 to 7.6 billion. 
Estimates were over $9 billion. Forward guidance of fourth quarter adjusted gross margin falling to as low as 41%. Estimates were about 48%. Seeing a huge hit here to the bottom line. Fourth quarter now forward adjusted EPS, 143 to 183. Estimates were for a 257. So really starting to see, Carol, um, some yeah. weakness here as they highlight the weakening demand environment. That's ugly. And that's what we want to know from what the companies are going to say in these earnings report and the executives. Demand. What are we seeing on the demand side of the equation? Supply has been a problem for so long, yeah. right? And so when you start to see the demand, the one thing I wanted to mention, well, the NASDAQ we mentioned is down about 30%. Remain the SOX is down about 35% so far this year. So we've really seen a, beaten, a beating we, in SOX. And we're heading into this earnings right season. Obviously, Micron lagging uh, with, with regards to its fiscal structure here. But when you hear them start to talk very ex explicitly about weakening demand in its words and really about the idea that it needs to now moderate that supply growth. And I think this is interesting because we talk so much about inventories on the retail side. And we forget with a lot of these manufacturing companies, you know, they really stocked up as well on their components. They really sort of shifted uh, their supply chains in a way to a accommodate what they thought was going to be a persistent upside. And now, if that upside is now to the downside, do they get left holding the bag? You know, Romain, a day like this, I always want to check in on the VIX and see what the volatility market's up to. Not really much of a move there, surprisingly. The VIX only up about half a vol point to 28.67. The VIX well, at the moment. Well, I, I, I don't care about the VIX, but but to Mike's point, I will say this: when you look at realized volatility on the S and P 500, it, it, it's through the roof. I mean, the only time you really saw it was back, of course, during the pandemic, and that was kind of an outlier. You you sort of take the pandemic out of it that March 2020, April 2020 uh, levels, and this is like the worst we've seen since the global financial crisis. Yeah. You go back to where those year-end targets are, not just for the S and P as a whole, but look at some of those targets on the individual stocks. We're nowhere near them. Yeah. Nowhere. I it, always care about the VIX, Caroline. I'm, good. No. Well, I was being told that I shouldn't anymore because it's too expensive and no one's using it anyhow. But I'm glad that you're still out there giving it love. What's the Vixen doing? <laughs> that's the that's such a better name, isn't it? What's Carol doing? Why is she laughing? What's I'm just that? listening. Yeah. I'm just enjoying the view. <laughs> All right, we got to run, guys. That's going to do it for our cross-platform coverage on radio, TV, and YouTube. We call it Beyond the Bell. We will be back again, same time, same place tomorrow. <laughs>
half. Meantime, stocks, big declines for all three time periods, uh, or three time, I guess, or indices, I guess. The S&P down 20 point a little bit more than 20% for the worst first half since 1970. But she said that it's rare to see this big of a divergence between what's going on with commodities and stocks. And she says these two areas of risk assets will ultimately reconnect. Oh, interesting. Yeah, we'll have to, which have, way, right? have, have to see. Well, they, they look like they were starting to, you know, commodities have sort of come off the peak a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, you know, if there these uh, concerns about recession continue and, and people really fixate on that theme, I think, you know, it's likely we will see uh, the two of them uh, couple up a little bit more. Uh, Carol, you know, one thing I love to do a check at this time of year at the end of a quarter is where does the U.S. stand globally? Mm-hmm. Not so good this year. If you look at uh, 24 developed markets, uh, U.S. comes in at number 20 year to date. Uh, of those 24, only two are up for the year. What's up? Uh, Portugal and Norway. So Norway, you know, obviously there's a little bit of a commodity commodity play uh, involved there with right. the, the only two markets that are up in, in the developed world. But also it's a big dollar story. You know, these mm-hmm. indexes are priced in local currency. When the dollar is this strong, right. that means their stocks aren't falling as bad as they are here in the home of the dollar. But we talk about that, right, with earnings, right? As the earnings start to come in and those international sales, right. as they're converted back into dollars, they're going to shrink right, in terms of how much money the company made. So, I mean, I know companies hedge, but I still think it has an impact, right? Yeah, still, and just one more headwind that they don't need at this this point in time. And I think it kind of goes to Brent Schutt's point about being bullish small caps, a little bit less exposed, more domestic focus, so can handle a stronger dollar better. All right, you're listening to Bloomberg.
Sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business App, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Micron Technology shares after hours down now by 3.11%. Micron is the biggest American maker of memory chips and it gave a weak forecast for the current period as consumers cut back on spending on computers and phones. It is on to the second half. Tomorrow is the first half, uh, the first day of the second half. Today, a losing day. S&P down 33 points, a drop there of nine-tenths of one percent, bringing the year-to-date loss, the loss for the first half, to 20.5 percent. The sell-off deepened after weak consumer spending data fueled worries about a recession. The S&P had its cruelest first half since Richard Nixon's presidency. The Dow today down 253, down eight-tenths of one percent. At one point, the Dow had been down 597, NASDAQ lower by 149, down by 1.3 percent. Here to date, wrapping up the first half, NASDAQ is down 29.5 percent. Tenure up 20, 30 seconds, 10-year yield 3.01 percent, spot gold 18.05 the ounce, and West Texas Intermediate Crude down 3.6 percent, 105.83 a barrel. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. Well, Charlie mentioned Micron, those stock, uh, the shares in the after hours, just down about 2.7%. So they're off their lows, but still trading lower on disappointment about what we just heard uh, from the company. So let's get to it and see what stands out for her. Bloomberg Intelligence analyst Paula Pencal joins us on the phone right here from our New York City bureau. So Paula, nice to have you here with Mike Regan and myself. Um, the numbers don't look so hot for this company. Right. Um, what I would say is that it was, I think it's a little more surprising because they just had an analyst day in mid-March or in um, mid-May. So there were only two more weeks for the quarter to end. And at that analyst day, they were very, very upbeat. Um, you know, they were cautious about the outlook overall, but they were very upbeat. One thing that took um, me by surprise was they, they definitely seemed cautious in the sense that they were focused on experimenting with these um, forward pricing contracts. And that led me to believe that, wait a second, <laughs> are these guys like preparing for the worst here and trying to lock in some pricing on their commercial side of the business? Um, and that is is in fact exactly what they were trying to do. You know, Paul, I wonder in the bigger picture, you know, all we've heard for the last few years has been uh, there's not enough chips, there's not enough chips, car makers need chips, everyone needs chips and they, they can't get them, you know. <laughs> right. But, so, I, you know, is there a bigger uh, story to be told for this terrible uh, first half of the year for chip maker stocks? I mean, is it a, a supply chain issue still or is it this shift in spending away from uh, electronics that we saw during the lockdowns and back into certain services, you know, people taking vacations. Is there any story to be told there on, on sort of what the big picture issue is for chip makers this year? Yeah, it's, there's a couple of things going on, but I think the most predominant one is, well, first let me quickly mention on the supply chain. The supply chain is improving, like post-COVID pandemic, post-China you know, austerity measures and complete lockdowns of cities. Um, you know, so, but supply chain is improving. The big story here is the consumer. I mean, and the consumer in China, because China is the largest market for smartphones. Okay. China is the second largest market for PCs. Okay. And with all the, the um, lockdowns in China, the Chinese consumer is not spending money. And the thing is, China is sort of sitting back and saying, like, okay, how do we get them to start spending again? Like, it wouldn't even mm. surprise me if China sort of implements some sort of stimulus to get their people to start buying again. So it's really about the consumer, China being a big part of that, and, you know, with inflationary concerns impacting, potentially impacting discretionary spending, I would say that is the biggest driver of this sell-off in tech and of, you know, the, 
the overall lower valuation valuations you're seeing here. I feel like Paula, it fits into some of the consumer spending numbers that we got this morning, right? Uh, U.S. consumer spending falling in May for the first time this year. Prior months revised even lower. So I do feel like, you know, we're seeing kind of all of these pieces start to fall in place. And do you feel like what we got from Micron is is just more of that? Of course it is. And the thing is, Micron has been talking a lot about how, you know, 50% of their business or almost 50% of their business is driven by these long-term secular trends um, in digitization, like everything AI-related, high compute. That's not going away. That is a long-term trend. We are digitizing our economy. It's transformational. Micron is at the center of that. And they've been talking a lot about that, but the truth of the matter is these guys are still a commodity product company, which means their product is not all that differentiated from the next guy, right? And so they can be interchangeable at the customer, hence they are more price driven. And so if the consumer falls off and there's more inventory in the market, that inventory going to get dumped into the market, prices are going to decline, and Micron's earnings are going to decline. And that's what you're seeing. That's why we see so much volatility in this name. It doesn't matter how well they execute on their mm. product. It's a great management team. They're doing such a great job, but it's a commodity product. Uh, Paula, the other big story, obviously, this year has been this bloodbath in cryptocurrency markets. And I know uh, NVIDIA is sort of the poster child in the the chip world for their exposure to the, the crypto market. But are there other – is there other pain being felt in the chip industry because of this crypto sell-off? You know, is there sort of a, a contagion effect that can drag other chip makers down, even if they're not directly exposed to, to crypto? Absolutely. In, in fact, Micron, NVIDIA, NVIDIA is a huge client of Micron, right? Right. And so if you think about it, with crypto going bust, you're going to have potentially have the concern is there may be fewer people mining and there's going to be less demand for GPUs. And GPUs are like these, you know, high compute GPUs. Micron, you know, provides product. They provide really high end, high value add memory to GPUs. So it hurts Micron. On the other hand, you look at like an Intel in early June. Intel mentions that, you know, they were, they were concerned about the macro environment hurting their numbers. And a lot of the tech stocks, including Micron, traded off as of, you know, additionally as of June when, when Intel made that comment. Well, Intel is having delays in putting out its um, mm -hmm. latest server right. um, product and S Sapphire Rapids. And Micron, that's a potential negative um, right. for Micron. Another right. one is Apple. Yeah. Apple, if Apple misses, right, right. you're going to see them all right, we got to run. I was just looking at the supply chain um, analysis on the Bloomberg uh, in terms of clients and suppliers and customers for Micron. Paula Pencal of Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you so much. Micron continuing to trade lower in the aftermarket.
Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130 to Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991 to Boston. Bloomberg 1061 to San Francisco. Bloomberg 960 to the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Business Week. All right, so when it comes to impact investing in ESG, what do investors want? We'll get to that with Sarah Bratton-Hughes over at American Century in just a moment. First up, though, back to some of the news after the close. Here is Charlie Pallet. Hi, thank you very much. Let's begin with MU Micron Technology. It is the largest American maker of memory chips. It delivered a weak forecast for the current period. As consumers cut back on spending on computers and phones, Micron says sales will be about $7.2 billion in its fiscal fourth quarter. Uh, the, the average analyst estimate uh, was $9.14 billion, according to data compiled by Bloomberg. It was a route for the history books. We have wrapped up the first half. It is on to the second uh, trading half of the year. The S&P 500 index down 21% in the first six months of 2022. That is the most for such a span since 1970. And the superlatives kept piling up across Wall Street with 10-year U.S. yields plunging to about 3% from a decade high of 3.5% in mid-June. The nearly 60% drawdown in Bitcoin since the end of March was the largest since the third quarter of 2021. However, Brent Schutte, Chief Investment Officer at Northwestern Mutual Wealth Management, was a guest right here on Bloomberg Business Week, and he told us he does see a better second half. I think you're already starting to see signs of inflation pulling back. The market is already showing you that they believe it's going to pull back. And I think that backdrop will lead to a stronger second half for stocks because we won't have to worry about the Fed continuing to hike us so far into a recession. Um, we certainly could have a recession, but it would be very, very mild. And I think the market's already discounted that. And as we wrap up the first half, the S&P today down another 33 points, uh, down nine-tenths of one percent. The Dow fell 253, down today by eight-tenths of one percent. NASDAQ down 149, down 1.3 percent. Ten-year yield, 3.01 percent. Spot gold, 1807 the ounce, while West Texas Intermediate crude down three and a half percent, 105. 93 a barrel, and we cannot ignore Bitcoin. Bitcoin today down 5.9 percent, 19,002 on Bitcoin. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. All right, Charlie, thank you so much. Well, a little chilly uh, on Wall Street, certainly in the first half of 2022. A little chilly in my studio as well, and chilly when it comes to ESG because in May, investors made the biggest ever monthly redemptions from U.S. exchange traded ESG funds based on Bloomberg Intelligence. Estimate. So let's get to our guest, see what she and her team are seeing when it comes to impact investing in ESG. Sarah Bratton Hughes is head of ESG and sustainable investing at America Century Investments. She joins us phone, uh, on the phone from New York City. American Century, by the way, their controlling owner is the biomedical research organization Stowers Institute for Medical Research. The firm directs 40% of its profits to their efforts to defeat life threatening diseases. So uh, they're not only investing for others, uh, they really are kind of walking the talk. Sarah, nice to have you here with Mike and myself. What interest are you seeing in ESG right now amid all the market volatility? Thank you for having me, Carol. We are still seeing um, increased interest in ESG and sustainable investing. Although those headlines about redemptions, uh, although the redemptions have gathered headlines, you can't really look at them in a vacuum. You have to look at them uh, versus the broader market as well. So uh, this year, we conducted the fifth edition of our uh, impact investing survey, and there were some really interesting uh, findings in there. I'll just talk about the three things that really surprised me. Um, here in the U.S., we've seen increased appeal of impact investing, but interestingly, it was probably the first or only survey I've ever seen that men uh, had preferred impact investing over women. And when you really peeled back the onion and looked at the numbers, what you saw was actually there's a delta around what the education and impact investing is for women, uh, particularly in the baby boomer generation. So as we think about the transfer of wealth, um, people often talk about the intergenerational transfer of wealth, uh, but I like to think of it first as an intergender transformation of wealth. What we've also noticed is the dominance, dominance of the S factors in the U.S. So um, consistently, um, U.S. investors, when they're looking at factors that they want to impact, uh, consistently have had more appeal in, in S factors than our global counterparts. So what we have observed this year, again, healthcare is the, the most important factor from a U.S. perspective. Uh, climate is up there second. 
but there isn't another E factor from a U.S. perspective, um, whereas that is dominating climate, it dominates the U.K., Germany, and Australia. And then the third and final bit is on greenwashing, where over 50% of the investors were concerned about greenwashing. I would actually, Carol, think that that number would be higher if the survey was in market now. I would agree. I would agree. Because I really do feel like anything with ESG and impact, people are like, okay, enough of it. We've seen a ton of money go into it. Now show me that you're really doing it. Mike, do you feel the same way? Yeah, well, it, I, you know, Carol, it's interesting, and Sarah, there's certainly been a bit of a backlash from the right side of the political uh, aisle uh, towards the, the notion of ESG in general. Sarah, I'm wondering if you view that uh, as any sort of r legitimate risk going forward, especially, you know, as these midterm elections come up and a lot of people expecting uh, the Republicans to, to gain House and uh, gain seats in Congress. Is there, is this backlash uh, sort of in the early phases, but I wonder if, is it a real risk to you, do you think? How are you thinking about it? So I, I look at what has really resulted in the rise of ESG investing, and it's um, the continued um, demand we've seen from a, both a, a retail client perspective, but also institutional clients. Um, it is the sort of economic argument for it when you've seen this massive rise of intangibles on balance sheets. If you look at the amount of intangibles on balance sheets in 1975, it was just 17%. The last figures in 2020 were over 20, um, were over 90%. But I think the biggest thing is the policy environment. So according to the UN principles for uh, responsible investing, the top 50 out of the top 50 economies, 48 have some form of policy designed to help investors consider sustainability risks, opportunities, and outcomes. Um, and for the long, longest time, the U.S. was the outlier um, in terms of pro policies that were providing tailwinds for sustainable investing. Um, and, and now we, we may become the outlier again. However, what we're seeing happening in the rest of the world, particularly Europe, is going to continue to provide tailwinds. Um, interestingly, this week, and I know there's a lot of conversation about the SEC and their uh, climate disclosures, but the EU uh, has actually very quietly um, reached a provisional agreement that require uh, non-EU-based companies with mm -hmm. greater than 50 million euros of AUM to have um, provide report on their ESG impacts um, and it's, it's defined and it's going to be legally mandated for U.S. companies that have right. a large presence over there. Yeah, especially on this, I do feel like we're looking largely to Europe in terms of what they're doing. It does feel like, though, a moment of reckoning when it comes to uh, impact investing, and I think investors are increasingly demanding it. Sarah, we scratched the surface. Hopefully we can continue this conversation in the future. I know it's something we talked about a lot here at Bloomberg. Sarah Bratton-Hughes, she's head of ESG and sustainable investing at America American Century Investments, joining us on the phone from New York City. I mean, Mike, the amount of money, uh, I think Bloomberg Intelligence expects something like $50 trillion by 2025. Um, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it just keeps coming. Yeah. In. All right, right now, let's get back to World of National News and Nancy Lyons. She is in D.C. Hey, Nance. Thanks, Carol. History was made today when Ketanji Brown-Jackson was sworn in as the newest Supreme Court justice, becoming the first black woman on the high court. After two oaths, Chief Justice John Roberts welcomed her to the bench. Now, on behalf of all of the members of the court, I am pleased to welcome Justice Jackson to the court and to our common calling. Jackson was confirmed to replace Justice Breyer back in April, but she had to wait until he stepped down at the end of the nine-month term. Well, today the Supreme Court did issue its final rulings for the term, including one that restricts the EPA's ability to force power plants to shift power generation away from fossil fuel plants to cleaner sources. This is under the Clean Air Act. It's seen as a victory for coal mining and a defeat for the Biden administration that had a goal of reducing carbon emissions by half in 2030. But in a victory for Biden, the court did side with his administration in its efforts to end the Trump-era immigration policy that forced asylum seekers to await approval in Mexico. Well, the House January 6th committee has issued a subpoena to former White House counsel Pat Cipollone. We get more from Bloomberg government reporter Jack Fitzpatrick. He's become a bit of a central figure because of his warnings that the uh, voter fraud claims did not have legal merit. He came up with uh, warning that Trump should not go to the Capitol on January 6th. 
Bloomberg government's Jack Fitzpatrick reports the committee wants Cipollone to testify behind closed doors this coming Wednesday, July 6. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Nancy Lyons. All right, Nance, thank you so much. Some call it refreshing, light-tasting ale, uh, just a, a perfect drink after a hard days of work, I'm just going to say. Uh, I don't know about you, Michael Regan, but are you ready for recycled toilet water <laughs> that is used in making beer? I mean, Carol, we talked about career risk earlier. You really, <laughs> you really set me up for failure here. So many jokes to be made from... Beer made from recycled toilet water wins admirers in, in Singapore is the headline from Sing Yi Ong, uh, our own. I don't know. I guess I would try. I mean, I'm hey, I'll try anything. I'll, I'll try a cold Once. beer. <laughs> right, right. And I, you know, I don't know. Does, doesn't all toilet water end up back in the water supply somehow? My dog doesn't have any problem with toilet water. So, <laughs> like, I'm just going to say, um, it's called New Brew. Uh, it is made with recycled sewage. It's a collaboration between the country's National Water Agency, uh, pub and local craft brewery, uh, Brewworks, Brewworks, I think it's called. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting. Like, they're, you know, what's what I find relevant is that we are talking increasingly about water and the yeah. world supply of fresh water, it's under stress. Yeah, yeah. Hey, it's an admirable <laughs> effort, you know, in sustainability for, for the water used in beer. I just wonder, uh, not such an admirable marketing scheme to... <laughs> <laughs> to, to get out there I'm not and drinking. Everyone. I'm not drinking the beer. I'm just. I'm just uh, having a little <laughs> tickle in my throat here. Well, uh, I asked the guys in the control room here if we could try some of this, and uh, uh, apparently, no one, no one's willing to go get us a couple to to wash down on this Thursday afternoon. You can see Paul Brennan, and he's shaking his head, yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> Paul said it, he thinks it tastes like a certain <laughs> famous beer brand on, on the market. I'm not going to say which one, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm, I'm such a weirdo. I, I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of willing to try it. I guess I don't know. Would you drink? Would you give it a taste? You know, I'm more of a wine person. So <laughs> we'll see if they do recycled toilet water for wine uh, and see what kind of vintage <laughs> comes up. Anyway, interesting story, especially as we head into the holiday weekend soon, uh, and a lot of beer will be probably. Uh, consumed through the July 4th holiday. All right, you're listening to Bloomberg.
Sports, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and at Bloomberg Quick Take. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From Bloomberg World Headquarters, I'm Charlie Pellet. Micron Technology shares now trading little changed after hours. Micron is the biggest American maker of memory chips. It gave a weak forecast for the current period as consumers cut back on spending on computers and phones. The first half is now behind us. It is on to the second half, and the sell-off deepened after weak consumer spending data fueled worries about a recession. The S&P 500 suffered its cruelest first half since Richard Nixon's presidency. So we had uh, the S&P for the first half down 20.5%. Today, the S&P fell 33 points. The Dow was down another 253. NASDAQ down 140. 49, falling today by 1.3%. The 10-year yield 3.01%. Spot gold down $10 the ounce to 1807, down six tenths of one percent. Dow Industrials down three and a half percent, 105.88 a barrel. I'm Charlie Pellet, and that is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Charlie, thank you so much. Well, another story in the new heist issue of Bloomberg Business Week is about the tax liens that cost generations of Black Americans their land. It is. A story that really will hit your heart. Um, let's get to it. Bloomberg News national team reporter Margaret Newkirk. It is certainly a part of U.S. history, probably another part of U.S. history that is is tough to swallow. She joins us on the phone from her Atlanta bureau radio studio. Uh, Margaret, um, I'm so glad you could join Mike Regan and myself on this Thursday. Tell us about your story and what, and take us to South Carolina and what's going on. Okay. Um, the story is based in um, St. Helena Island, uh, which is... I think we have a little technical problem, so let's see if we can get that uh, worked out, and hopefully we can hear Margaret, because this is certainly, Mike, an interesting story. We said it's part of the heist issue, which has a story we talked about earlier about, uh, you know, within the Bitcoin right. universe, right, and a huge cyber hack right. when it comes to cryptocurrencies. But this one also is a story we've covered a lot at Bloomberg yeah, about right. right generational wealth, especially for black Americans who haven't been able to generationally build wealth because so much of wealth in our society, in our country, is a result of property. Right, right. Really an important and, and I would say well done uh, story. So congratulations to Margaret. And it's interesting, you know, the heist issue uh, is often famous for some kind of fun stories. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I remember Zeke's story about the Super Bowl rings being sold and certainly the crypto heist uh, story is, is kind of fun. This one I, I recommend everyone read because it's a, it's a much more important story. It tells a really, um, uh, you know, as you said, a, sort of an important, what seems like an injustice that, that happened to a lot of uh, families in, in the country. And I don't know, do we have Margaret back now? Uh, I think they're working on it. Yeah. And I think what's interesting is it's part of like, I, I think about what we learned about Black Wall Street and, you know, certainly with George Floyd um, now, what, over two years or so already, uh, you know, increasingly the conversations about inequalities, gaps in our society. Uh, and I know Bloomberg and the and news team has done a great job in, in bringing them to light. Um, but I do think about property wealth. And I think about even my own family, you know, on my dad's side, um, my grandparents uh, had property over in Europe. They lost it yeah. after World uh, War II, but came here, started all over again. And, you know, my dad buying a house all cash. And it was just so, like, this was just something that was so ingrained that this was important to do. And he certainly passed it on to myself and my six brothers and sisters. You know, but we know that not everybody has the same opportunity. And, and sometimes it's the financial system that doesn't, allow people to tap into mortgages as easily as some others. Right. And, you know, I think our listeners would also be interested in the uh, investment angle of this. There are mm -hmm. hedge funds that <clears throat> buy uh, these tax liens uh, from the local governments and investors buy $3 billion to $5 billion in tax liens a year. Uh, and one source quoted uh, Brad Westover, he's the executive director of the National Tax Lien Association. He says, well, most of the hedge funds uh, and people who are investing in the space, they don't really recognize that this is simply an arbitrage business. They mm. do not necessarily know anything about the demographics of the delinquent taxpayer. Uh, so, you know, in a way, Carol, it relates back to the ESG question. 
Everybody is more interested in knowing what they're invested in and making sure they're not doing mm-hmm. something wrong w- with where they put their their money in. So, uh, you know, I think this is an important shedding an important light on uh, that to the investors in this space. Well, it makes you wonder too, Mike. You know, ultimately, what is the compensation that we own? Perhaps, you know segments of our population, uh, black Americans, for some of the injustices that have been done, you know, over hundreds of years uh, that many would argue, uh, maybe data would certainly support that they have been set back uh, generationally because of all of these moves. We have uh, been able to connect with Mar- Margaret Newkirk. She is the national team reporter at Bloomberg News. Her story, uh, Take In Tax Liens Cost Generations of Black Americans Their Lamb. It is part of the new heist issue that's out from Business Week. Margaret, we've only got about three minutes, but take us to South Carolina and what is going on. Um, <clears throat> the story looks at... Um a family that lost their land uh, generations ago, but didn't realize it until um, sometime in the 60s. And they lost it to a tax lien um, that they didn't know was even on the property. And then they were suddenly evicted from this property. It It was a fairly large property on the coast of St. Helena Island, which is one of the sea islands outside of Beaufort. And so white families were able to sort of parlay that land into um, wealth. I mean, they would have been well off anyway, but they were more so. And then her family, the woman who lost the land, um, you know, they had, some of them got to college, but they had to go into the army to get there. They just didn't have any family wealth to sort of build right. that generational wealth. It, it's it, it's a great story, uh, Margaret. Congratulations. I was telling Car- Carol before you came on, really important story. Um, and I think, you know, it, it, there's the tale of the one family uh, that you relay very well. But this is a bigger issue. I, uh, I noticed in your story you have a line saying black families in the U.S. actually bear a heavier tax burden than whites. Could you d- unpack that a little bit for us and describe what the situation is there and how it came to be? Um, that's been going on for a long time. The first time that I was aware it was documented was like in the early 70s. Um, the Federal Reserve just documented it again in 2020, as did the University of Chicago. It's how property is assessed, and there can be a lot of um, factors that, are, that help white families. Like you look at the location that helps your market value, but you don't look at it when you're doing the assessment. So it just becomes... I think one study showed it 10 to 13 percent higher for black families. Wow. Margaret, we're jumping around. Just got about a minute or so left here. But you you talked, too, about tax sales and the implications of that. Can you just kind of quickly, uh, and we're going to highly recommend that everybody check out the new issue, the heist issue of Business Week, so they can read Margaret's story in its entirety. But tax sales, how this may be led to the problem, just kind of quickly. Uh, Yeah, what it's about is tax lien sales, and that's where investors buy the rights to somebody's property because of back taxes, and then they wait a certain period of time um, before they actually get the deed, but that um, during the, they earn interest, and that interest can be, like in Texas, it's 25% for one year and 50% for the next. And so the family ends up not only paying the taxes they couldn't pay in the first place, but often far more. And is this why, in terms of some black Americans, they lost their lands, as you lay out in South Carolina? You just got about 25 seconds. Uh, yes, it's been shown to do that in uh, cities all over the country, specifically D.C. and Baltimore, Chicago, Cleveland. Those are the ones that come to mind. Well, we are so glad we were at least able to touch upon your story. It is a very important part of you know coverage that we do here at Bloomberg to try and understand some of the injustices that have certainly done uh, that have been handed out between Black and White Americans, and we see it big time when it comes to the property market. Um, Margaret, thank you so much, and and for bearing with our techni- technical difficulties. Margaret Newkirk, national team reporter at Bloomberg News, her new story it is in the heist issue of Bloomberg Business Week, which is. Out on newsstands, on the Bloomberg and at Bloomberg.com. Mike, it is always a great summer read. Thank you for joining me today. Oh, anytime, Carol. Happy to happy to be here. You didn't mess it up. <laughs> for once. You did well. <laughs> Have a good and safe evening, everyone. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>